Yo, you're watching another exciting episode of GW Smoke Break TV Live right here in the marijuana multiverse. And I'm so honored to be accompanied today uh, by Jesse BioVortex. What a treat. He's out in Humboldt County. And without further ado, my bro, if we can get a quick introduction before we jump into the show. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Jesse BioVortex, um, coming from the coast of California and Trinidad. Um, been working with cannabis and breeding for, well, since 1996. Um, I've been growing and um, actually, I guess I've been working with cannabis since 93, but I've been growing since 96, breeding since 98. Um, and I'm in love with the plant and um, it has brought me all over the world. It's taught me so much and connected me with so many people. So I want to give back in the way that I breed and, and work with the plant. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you so much. You know, um, we want to start off the show by acknowledging um, some of the atrocities, uh, the negative shit that's out in the world. Excuse my language. And I know you have some things on your mind to share, and I'd love to start there, please. Well, I appreciate that because um, it's kind of hard to think about just normal stuff right now while um, so many children are, are suffering um, just uh, horrific, horrific um, atrocities and, you know, starvation and bombing. And um, so I, I want to just remind everyone that we are all one, that the the concept of us and them is an illusion and that we should treat all life with respect and love and that they are all our children um and we should love and respect ourselves enough to love and respect all life thank you jesse uh, before the show you mentioned it was like a beautiful saying you know uh give life like water come together like sand can you repeat that please yeah you know it's a full poem that i would like to actually bring up on the phone um, oh you wrote that that's cool yeah here what's up to everybody watching as well man thanks for tuning in guys jesse's out on the coast uh, so the reception might be a little spotty yes we're here jesse yeah okay um no i was gonna try to uh pull it up on the phone um i wanted to be doing this on the computer but for some reason the mic wasn't working on that so i'm on the phone and i'd prefer to actually read that poem but I, I don't have it in front of me so um maybe we can come back to that later 100 percent, 100 percent, man okay i'm gonna go in chronological order while i smoke chronic as i listen to you so um back in 96 did you move to humboldt or uh are you from humboldt no i was um in the santa cruz mountains above palo alto grew up in like the oak bay uh forests up in the the hills um old like commune kind of area and um so started growing back in that time just just um in the soil in the hills and and um you know i always really liked herb and had good herb around me and there's a lot of really good work going around in the santa cruz hills at that time um so i i love putting away seeds of my favorite things and um, I ended up moving up here in 98 when I, uh, and I immediately started growing, but I grew from seed and I immediately started breeding and continuing the seed work. Um, so much was always just clones up here. Um, there's a little bit more of a seed culture out in the mountains and um, certain areas around here, but a lot of the indoor and depths and stuff were just completely seed around here or completely clones around here. And I thought it was really important to to continue that work with the plant because it's about um, you know evolution and progression um, and mutualism together. And I, you know clones are really cool to be able to um, isolate and and know that you have something that you want. But it's it's a little bit of a dead end um, if you only do that. And so many growers up here never even saw a male. You know males are just something to fear and get rid of, and people wouldn't even grow from seeds because of that concept and it was real you know if, if you're we got seeded then you couldn't sell it you know which is kind of funny because of the incredible value of seeds at the same time too it's like those seeds that are the ones that gave rise to all of these cultivars that we love and you know if somebody does really good breeding work then the seeds almost worth is worth more than the flower 
But then there's also this concept that it's the second there's a seed in a pound, now it has no value, uh, which is kind of funny. I mean, I don't want to smoke any seeds in anything, um, but uh, it it I have no problem breaking out a couple little really nice big plump seeds from something if it's not fully pollinated, um, you know, and that's like could be a treasure if it's some something that you really liked and so a lot of stuff i started with were those kind of oh yes there is a, a seed inside of this flower that i really liked um and so if i really liked it i put it away when i was when i was a teenager and um and that gave rise to a lot of different things i work with now like uh, athena kush dude so awesome man uh i, I want to jump around but i want to stay in this chronological order so personal question were your parents like back to the landers or hippies anything like that yeah actually my mom was a back to the lander uh she lived on a, a thing called the land that would would started out in um the hills right where i grew up um it was also there was a political aspect of that too there was like front landers and back landers um and That'd so be- my mom had had goats and she built her own spot out there. They had gardens, they set up irrigation with springs and it was a whole community, but it was also connected with the, um, the nonviolence movement um, that was happening during the Vietnam war. And so the um, Institute for the study of nonviolence uh, with David Harris out in Stanford, um, you know, was connected. Joan Baez, actually, I, the, the place where I grew up is her old place and she named it struggle mountain. And that's where I come from. Dude, were you born like, uh, like, were you born there in a hospital? I was born, I mean, I was, uh, you know, birth started with a midwife uh, up in that area, uh, in the land. It's actually by a lake out in the, in the woods, um, kind of commune style. But after several, almost a day of labor, actually, I think it turned into 30 hours. My mom had to go down to Stanford Hospital and I was born there with a whole lot of people there, apparently. like. Um, all came down to support my mom that's so cool dude there's a tv here in case you're wondering why i'm looking this way this is where i can see you uh and the camera's right here of course so um i'm from san jose right born and raised and i'm trying to picture where you grew up because my my confession well it's not really a confession but like i started slanging in 90 i think maybe the first time was 90 well 97 and uh graduated high school 98 and you really had to have a tie a really cool plug like somebody that you're tight with to have a plug in Santa Cruz. And on the south side of San Jose, I was in the street side of things, and we never really had a tight plug, you know, to Santa Cruz. And so even though, you know, it's infamous or famous for the weed, growing up, I never had a connection to it, you know what I'm saying? And so I know about Half Moon Bay. I know about Palo Alto. I know about Skyline Boulevard. So I'm just trying to picture where you're at, where you grew up, you know what I'm saying? Well, uh, you probably know Page Mill Road, Skyline Bol- Boulevard, yeah. right yeah. right there. Yeah, Probably 20 minutes from where you grew up. Page Mill Road and Skyline Boulevard. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, wow, dude. Wow, wow, wow. That's so cool. Because, I mean, if it wasn't for conversations like this, those kinds of communities, and I think you guys wanted it that way to be under the radar, you know, like nobody knows about it. Well, I mean, it was both like the back to land. That was definitely nice. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, everyone was like kind of stewards of the land and the people who owned that at the time um, were, were good with that intentional community that had been built out there. Um, but it did eventually get sold to open space and they came in and they bulldozed everyone's home and completely destroyed the community back. I think it was 70 eight maybe so right before i was born um but then there was other um spots that people moved to so where i was born was very close to that right literally on skyline and and um and page mill and uh and that was a, a spot called stallings um by triangle lake and then um then we moved to struggle mountain which was um joan baez's old place after that how far um, is struggle mountain from from there excuse me Oh, uh, just under about a mile and a half or so. Yeah. Very cool, dude. Very cool. Okay. Next question is this one. Speaking of the legendary Santa Cruz mountains, you know, the more conversations I have, like at the Emerald cup a couple weekends ago, maybe it was last weekend. It's all a blur. Uh, dude, 
like Santa Cruz is legendary. Like a lot of folks in Humboldt came from Santa Cruz. Like from what I understand, a lot of shit started in Santa Cruz. And the last thing I'll say is that growing up, right, uh, I started going to Humboldt in, in 2001. I only knew Kevin Jodry until I started GW Smoke Break in 2019. And so uh, I didn't know much about anything besides the basics of hustling and, you know, growing and, and so forth. But uh, watching movies like uh, Reservoir Dogs, have you seen that movie? Of course. Res yeah. yeah, yeah, dude. So there's a scene where he's uh, talking about getting ripped off in Santa Cruz, trying to buy weed in Santa Cruz, or his connect was from Santa Cruz. And so even though, again, growing up in the game, I never had a connect in Santa Cruz. It's like you hear these stories and in the movies. And now with sitting here with you, you're from the mountains. And when I think of the Santa Cruz mountains, I think of like Scott's Valley. I think of, uh, you know, San, uh, what's the Ben Loman, Boulder Creek. But you were north of there. So in reality, bro, what, I, what I'd love to hear from you is what can you share about the Santa Cruz Mountains? Because I rarely think of it as that, that freaking whole area. Yeah, I mean, the the skyline and the nine, um, it's it's a pretty amazing spot because it's just a little bit away from the coast, but like has that full on coastal influence. It's not that long of a drive to the beach. And it's um, kind of right where the the redwoods start for that that coastal spot. So, you know, I'm, I'm back in the, the old growth redwoods up here, but um, you know, the redwoods are right next to my home, even though it was Oak and Bay Hills. Um, and it was right where that spot where, you know, the fog burns off more and you get more of the sun, a little bit more of a, a good growing um, area, but still not have that um, coastal influence. And, and the fog would kind of come through at night and it would feed all the oak trees. And it, so it didn't really matter if it rained as much because of that. Um, and it, yeah, it that location from the ocean and being about 2000 feet up in the the hills really um i think shaped that environment and there's also a place that was close to you know a giant um populated area like the bay but was completely rural at the same time um it's all just it's just trees and, and hills and um oaks and poison oak and bays and madrones and then um and then as soon as you go down that hill then you get into the the redwoods as you journey to the coast yeah, man. It's just so beautiful because, again, growing up in San Jose, I'm embarrassed to say how how infrequent I go visit the Redwoods out here. Um, let's not talk about it. <laughs> but um, growing up, you mentioned that you were around a lot of good weed. They're right here right now. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, you're the, I'm learning from your lifestyle, dude. Believe me when I tell you when I see your pictures being at the beach, I'm like, dude, I'm learning, man. Uh, growing up, you said Careful at the beach. you were around. It's a very grounding thing <laughs> every day. I'm grateful to be on heading in this direction, man. Like again, when I started, it was just sales and growing and really flat and static and no heart. You know, I was angry if anything, just on the street and shit. Um, but anyways, uh, so uh, grow, growing up, you're around a bunch of good weed. So that means you're around some cool operators, some cool growers, breeders. Um, I'd love to hear more about the culture that you experienced growing up in the mountains here in Santa Cruz. Um, yeah, you know, I was, I was in both worlds though. Cause I'm also going to school in Palo Alto and then also out in the Hills. Um, and there is a lot of the, you know, there's the old time hippies who kind of, you know, made their homesteads and grew some nice big plants in their spots and, and did that every year and kind of just, um, worked with their like smaller community of trusted friends and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's actually was still pretty illegal back then you know this is before 215 or anything had even passed uh so it's pretty amazing to see that that difference um through that time period um i always like we didn't uh, like to provide it too so um yeah i was definitely selling at an early age like to just always have that kind of around um me at all times and like and i just i felt like the plant just kind of always found me so i was well known for having really good herb and at a, from a young age and that never stopped. <laughs> That's so freaking cool, man. Um, <clears throat> so I know firsthand that Palo Alto is like a really nice area. You know, you could probably sell your bags for good prices, you know, you're having good weed, especially being. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, we had no money, but like 
going to school in Palo Alto, one of the richest places around during the dot com boom. Uh, it's very interesting to see that change because, like, rental prices, uh, you know, quadrupled in a couple years while we we're there. And, um, you know, like, my dad's a carpenter, my mom's waitress. Uh, while we're like, you know, friends with CEOs and and uh, a lot of people in the tech industry, and uh, anyway, a lot of the friends I went to school with, you know, plenty of, of money. So. A lot of kids like to get herb every lunch break. So uh, that was one way to help out with the bills and things. And what's fascinating, man, is like it's guys and gals like you that existed in both wor worlds. The marijuana multiverse is what I like to call it now. And like the normal world or the matrix, you know, you're literally plug and unplug and plug and unplug and on like a daily basis, I imagine. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I hear the legend of uh, 420 uh, up in Marin Bay and uh -huh. I think of the historic nature that the mountains have played here in California for growing pot. Uh, you know, I think we're discovering like the roots of our culture, you know, and how it's grown from these epicenters. I, you know, one of the things that, um, I could have played Jesse. a big, what's that? You're guilty. <laughs> one <laughs> of the things that I'm a little too young for, but I imagine played a big role in that area was, um, the surf culture, uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, traveling around and um, going to places where they're bringing back seeds um, like Afghanistan and having those first Afghanica kind of varieties um, that were then uh, bred with and hybridized with um, some of the more Mexican varieties because both uh, were in that area. One, because it's California and things were coming from south, but also because there was a surf culture and people would like, you'd hear about people smuggling in seeds that were put inside their boards and all kinds of things like that. Um, and I think, me. yeah. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so I get it, right? Surfers going around the world, but Afghanistan, that you got to really get out there. That's like the hippie trail, right? I mean, Mexico's yeah. got proximity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't know different people's travel plans and all of that, but people go to some, you know, different places and, and also maybe they're getting those Afghan seeds from other locations that they're going once they get out of there too. Uh, but reaching out like that and having some of those Northern varieties blended in, whether it's, um, you know, Northern India or, uh, Pakistan or, or Afghanistan or Kashmir, where these varieties might be coming from, from, um, having them bred in with these uh, more Southern varieties, I think gave rise to a lot of the, the really dank, but larger growing um, resistant varieties that worked in our area that, that also uh, finished flowering within time. Because like, if you're getting all your stuff from down South, we're talking about 13 plus week uh, flowering times instead of, you know, getting to anywhere from seven to 10, if you're getting something more Northern. Yo, so you've been breeding since 98. Are you yeah. into the history of the plant as well? Because I'd love to pick your mind a little bit as to um, you, what you've seen and your perspective on the progression of the game. When I talked with Jackson, this guy was like, he, yeah, he, was, he, was, he was taking us back to like what he believes is like the real deal origin of, of like the Hindu Kush or uh, in like Leightonville Leggett. <clears throat> I gotta get some water. But, uh, whatchamacallit, you know, it was beautiful to to listen to him talk about that. And you having bred for so long and being in the community for so long, I'm just curious to know um, if you've heard any stories about, like, those first breeding projects, if you've come in contact with people, old school guys like that. Um, yeah, definitely. But I don't really, like, um, see myself as any kind of weed historian. I can't compare with Jackson's... Um, no. deep knowledge and his his conversations with people and he grew up you know um in an area and with family and friends and stuff where he was completely surrounded with that culture um from the beginning with me um actually something although like i was probably two years old watering cannabis plants uh, a thing happened at at struggle mountain um well one it already had a decent amount of um uh attention from the 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 movement against vietnam and it's actually where david harris was arrested by the fbi and things like that for um because a lot of people started uh, draft resistance during um vietnam and that certainly uh, upset 
the powers that be at that time. But um, another incident happened later uh, when I was a kid where um, I believe there was, um, I can't remember if it was a murder or rape, but there was a violent act in the area and it had a lot of uh, police up and um, they had come by their area and, and talked to different people and letting them know that there was uh, potentially somebody dangerous on the loose. And one of the police officers actually um, was retiring and he had noticed, although he didn't see the secret garden that was like a little down the hill, noticed that there was some drying um, or potted weed plants that were like kind of in the back around the house and um, basically said like, I don't care that much, but you want to get rid of that. And so the community decided to um, to completely not grow anymore because it wasn't worth the the risks. So I, you know, I didn't have that where, you know, someone like Jackson, Mean Gene got to um, grow up uh, growing. And, and it wasn't until I, you know, I, I went out in the hills on my own at 16 and, and started growing and, uh, you know, and where I found nice soil and, um, and, and good sunspots where I could do a little gorilla growing. Well, if anything, Jesse, I think you deserve that much credit because, you know, you've taken your own initiative to pursue your direction, your dreams. And I mentioned Jackson because I see you and him as peers. I do. You know, I think you guys hang out together every once in a while. And <clears throat> as I mentioned to you, I'm going to grab a cup of water in a sec. Uh, it's just right next door. I have a great intuition when it comes to cannabis operators, you know, just to have like a, I don't call it a sixth sense, but you know, something like that. And the energy I get off Jackson and the energy I get from you, I feel like are two separate, intelligent, you know, operators that approach their craft like smart. And when I see you guys two interacting with each other, it to me, it's like it confirms that because it's like, okay, you know, like minds think together, et cetera. So just trying to pay you a compliment, you know, we all have different ways of communicating. I have a tendency to talk really fast. Um, but, uh, and then Jackson, you know, he's, he's a little slower and he can go for it. So yeah, I'm not, I don't mean to compare by any means. Um, and, and so like you moved to Humboldt specifically to pursue more dank activities. Um, well, first I just want to say, you know, Jackson's one of my favorite breeders and just a top notch human, one of my favorite people to talk to about cannabis and all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, one of the few people I kill my phone battery with the sometimes when we're talking uh especially like you know when we're we're working for uh breeding in the yard doing breeding work or watering in the yard and stuff it's fun uh to just to just talk about all kinds of stuff you know and it might start with plants but it goes into dreams and philosophy um and his his mind for um the plant and the world and his memory and his uh for for plants is is bar none um and his nose is incredible and his ability to pull out memories from once he smells something too. I think of like, you know, the Harry Potter where, uh, you know, they pull out the strands of the memories and stuff. So like Jackson will smell something and then you can just get that full like <laughs> memory dream pulled out of the, the head. Um, so he's, he's a special one that, um, yeah, was, was born to, to work with this special plant. Gotta take a bomb rip. No, yeah. man, uh, to share a little bit with you. Jackson introduced a new word to my vocabulary, but it's basically uh, something to do with the smelling. And um, if you have time to watch our interview, um, there's a good like 20 minutes where he talks about it. Um, but ultimately, you know, what I gathered is that since he was like eight, nine years old, he was around chronic and, <clears throat> you know, like the note, the smells left an impression with him since then. And he talked about smoking weed with with Ted from Canada Country Farms when he was like nine years old. When he, oh, Jackson wow. was nine years old, we we just did an event together too called Jar Wars. That was really fun with uh, Ted and Reggie out there. And um, yeah, we just we just brought a bunch of our uh, you know varieties. There was a lot of we had a lot of sisters from the different breeding projects, so we got to like compare and um, yeah, we just had our our nose in it, and uh, it, it was it was super fun just riffing with each other and and showing off all the the dank from the year and then uh we went for like a nice mushroom walk after 
uh, found a bunch of cool things, some beliefs and matsutakis and yeah, and uh, some bear tooth and super fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And before we focus on what you feel you're good at or what you really enjoy about breeding and so forth, I just want to share with you about Jackson that he's really chill and calm now, you know? And by the way, he was talking uh, and we talked about like antisocial kind of vibes because you're in the game, you can't trust nobody and how he's kind of, you know, worked through that or experienced that. And so he gave me a picture of himself as an eight, nine year old kid smoking weed like a like a hool. I just imagine like a hooligan, like a little roughneck fucker, you know, fucking hanging out with Ted, smoking weed with Ted at nine. I'm like, damn, you're a little badass, dude. You know, and um, I just share that because you might get a kick out of that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, if Jackson has a real good connection to his nose and memory, you know, we all have a reason for our passion and what really enjoy about the experience of breeding and growing. Um, what would you say is something that you've observed? And it's hard maybe to talk about oneself, but when you when you interact with other breeders, what do you think you're like – makes you unique you know hmm well i mean we're all unique and also have similarities so uh but i think i uh i pay attention a lot and i i i really enjoy observing nature and um cannabis has helped enforce that and that's um i have a very uh artistic mind but also very logical mind so um you know like that kind of scientific method of of observation and understanding what i can and can't know from an observation and cataloging that and having a whole history of the different things that i've i've worked with and and yeah you know, like jackson um is an excellent one for that because he's he's looking at all kinds of different um attributes of the plant and seeing how those play out in the next stage of breeding. Um, and so that's as well as something that I tried to do. Um, but I really, I like to label very well and I like to, uh, document. And, um, so like always taking photos, always taking notes, always, um, making sure that every seed has all of the information that I need and I can look at the the numbers and letters that I write and I can know the entire history of of a seed that's in a bank so like just having some little name scribble on it like would uh upset me <laughs> I guess like anything that's like not fully labeled or, or mislabeled then I I really enjoy knowing that I know the entire history the grandparents and the great grandparents and the great great parents and then also the method in which i might have gone about a breeding project whether uh, it was back crossing heavy or you know doing sibling generations um or different hybrids and and knowing as much as i can about each different variety and i mostly concentrate on my own knowledge like i know what i know so uh as far as like weed history i actually don't pay that much attention because um i don't anything that's hearsay or what somebody else said or whatever i don't really put any of that in my brain but what i do keep in my brain is what i did myself and what i know and or what i've heard directly from uh, a breeder i know and trust that's so dope dude <clears throat> i saw you post a picture of your notebooks and uh <laughs> i think that's awesome uh, what i wanted to ask before we move forward is that you know, ultimately, like you're saying, it's like we all have, uh, of course, we all have brains, we all have heart, we all have hearts and souls. And, uh, you know, when those are aligned, or, you know, you find your passion, and, you know, sometimes in life, it just opportunities open, or you're able to just run with it, you know. And um, what the heck was it? Where, where, where was I going with this? Is, uh, yes, is I think that the war on drugs has had a huge detrimental effect on our society at the same time. I think that pressure and that challenge has um, spurred, you know, certain humans to rise up to that challenge and basically do this to the government, you know, like Nikki Lestretto did at the Emerald Cup, uh, in her words. 
So my question to you, is, and, and, and I'm, oh, I've always been fascinated by the people that are in this industry, you know, and before GW Smoke Break, I never was able to socialize besides like Kevin, you know, and it was more on different vibe, you know, it was more like the game vibe. It wasn't, there, there wasn't no culture in it for me. You know, that was the culture is, is, is everything derived from the paper aspect of it for me personally, you know, and I've evolved so much, but what do you think, Jesse, about the war on drugs and how it's affected our psyches and, you know, for good and for worse, I can say I have PTSD. I have trauma. Well, I think it's a racist, disgraceful, horrific thing that happened uh, since the thirties. Um, it's been absolutely targeted at black and Latino um, in such a horrific way. It's destroyed lives. And it also was targeted at hippies and people who were um, working towards nonviolence and protesting the violence uh, in Vietnam. And so it's been weaponized uh, against peace activists and against uh, minorities and marginalized uh, ethnicities. And um, it's it's a horrific part of our horrific past uh, and present because there's a lot of people in jail right now. and um, you know, it's also very upsetting that so much of the people who were able to get land and be in this space are white, white males. I'm a middle aged white male. And, you know, so is Jackson, so is Kev. They're all amazing people with big hearts. Um, but that's not lost on me um, that that's you know there's a reason for that. And it's it's it, the disgusting racist one that um, kept people uh, from this healing plant and destroyed lives, destroyed families. Um, and there's still people in jail. And, and, um, I think a lot of what we do and celebrate and in, in the cannabis community is, is, is nonsense until everyone's out of jail. Um, I think it messed up our psyches in so many different ways. A lot of people who think they're progressive and actually like think that cannabis is okay, still have prohibition mindset on things and, and watching that, uh, you know, happened and like the way the slow adjustment from medical to this wreck, uh, legalized and tax world, um, you know, people have this concept like, oh, well, that's too much, you know, or that's like, you know, and, and I don't think anything's too much with cannabis. I think everyone should be able to grow the plant however they want, as long as they're not hurting the environment or they're not uh, doing things that hurt other people, like everyone should be able to have a relationship with the plant and it should be completely decriminalized. And so I think legalization and recreation and regulation is all nonsense and it's part of the same stupid capitalist system. I'm, I'm in full agreement with you. For the record, part of the reason why I started to jump in the game was to be a total rebel against the government and, and all that. Because growing up or living two years in Bolivia where my dad's from and having a history teacher that was very much liberal and would point out i read howard zinn's people's history of the united states um uh, thanks to him and like changed my world um what was the thing i was gonna say real quick is um thank you for that uh it's also not lost on me the words that you said you know it's just hard to say it um being in my position you know what i'm saying and then um Oh, shoot, well, I see, I see it as a responsibility to say it from my position. No, no. Thanks, man. Thanks. Because, um, you know, um, also what I don't want it to be lost on us um, is the fact that, um, and I can't help but use foul language, um, a lot of these fucking bastards, a lot of these fucking um, inhum inhumane, inhuman people are went from sh uh, giving oppression during the war on drugs uh, putting us in jail, traumatizing us, et cetera, different ways to now these same bastards are, um, coming into the legalized weed game and they're exerting their political connections to monopolize what I, what I'm saying, Jesse is fucking let them have that commercial aspect of fuck you, let, fucking cannibalize yourselves. But I am sharing this because I feel that we have a responsibility to hold the line for craft and, and, I like this conversation because you're doing it, you know, with your dead, that, that, that attention to detail, that that's, that's it right there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it's kind of difficult. I mean, one, uh, 
it's nice to see you said you know cannibalize themselves and it's beyond that like actually the the california tax regulated space is impossible even for those operators to do <laughs> well um you know so much of it was uh designed to actually um suck money out of the community in in you know in the emerald triangle we were a little bit isolated and from the the rest of the world as far as economic uh and political pressures in some ways um and you know people were able to take in their economic means in their own hands through through working with this plant but the second legalization happened it, there was a uh, very intentional effort to suck all the money out of out of the hills anything that was buried anything that was put away uh with these insane permits these insane um uh, regulatory requests, these engineering firms that just just took advantage of farmers. And um, so it was just fines, regulations, consulting. And so many people got completely sucked dry, you know, trying to participate in this environment. And uh, it hurt our community bad um, economically. And it hurts it at all levels. It hurts it at the restaurants, at the stores, for artists, for music, for um, farmers and food. Everything that we did up here, it, 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 it affects, you know. And the industries that we had before that were, um, you know, logging and fishing. And we saw the destruction, you know, like in that capitalist colonial model it's take until it's gone and that's what happened to the salmon and that's what happened to the redwoods we have less than one percent of our old growth redwoods because uh the people that committed a crime against all of humanity and the environment of the world they stole something that belongs to everyone to the earth and uh, very much to the native people that were here and um, committed genocide on them in the process of also completely cutting down uh trees that are um in many cases, uh, 2000 years old and up and all of the evolution and time to make that um, ecosystem that was incredibly abundant for the people who were here uh, just in a short period of time was completely destroyed. Um, and so, you know, back to the landers being able to grow food and grow weed and bring um, a, a way of bringing um, creating an economic system in our community that was outside of that extractive model uh was really important um and it did get out of balance you know once something's worth a lot of money um and people doing things with more greed like there was a lot of uh you know when the purple craze happened everyone had these giant uh diesel grown indoors hundred lighters that were like even underground sometimes because you know the helicopters were out but these had high impacts on the environment. So, um, you know, that was part of that same kind of model. Uh, and it was the extreme uh, prices uh, that were created by prohibition that that had a lot to do with that. And now we see the complete swing of things being below the cost of production. And so, again, it's just completely an out of balance system where um, if it wasn't for any of these things, we could have you know like people could be growing really good dank and having it be at a balanced price and um instead of these extreme swings of uh imbalance of of extreme price that leads towards more illicit activity and leads to more environmental damage to the price plummeting and uh making it so uh you can't even um meet uh cost of production although some of the really good farmers who are already vegetable farmers um are pretty good at that because uh you know if you can make it work growing uh onions and broccoli and things like that then uh then you know how to do things a lot more efficiently um one big issue we had too is uh <laughs> taking the indoor concept outdoors and so like that idea that everything needs to be this specialized soil and you need all of these uh, expensive nutrients that might not even be good for the plants and that if there's any kind of uh, bugs and it must be sprayed instead of creating a again it's about balance and if you create a balanced thriving environment for the plant where there's polyculture and there's a balance in life then things don't get out of balance but if you just have a bunch of smart pots on a clearing with no other life around you get spider mites or you get something there's nothing to keep that in balance um, so i think uh, the way you 
maintain balance is through diversity and it's through diversity of people and community, but and it's through diversity in soil life. It's through diversity in, in the environment, um, native pollinators and plants. Um, and so I think, yeah, polyculture and giving back to the earth uh, are key to, to growing cannabis correctly. Absolutely. I think it's dope, man. I think everything you're saying is so, so dope. And when we talk about cannabis culture, this is my dream for our cultures, for these ideologies that you've shared with us to come to the forefront and to um, <clears throat> uh, influence, you know, all cannabis enthusiasts to tickle their mind and, and, and provoke uh, new thoughts. And in that way, I believe that with all the taxation regulation, yes, I agree. The reality is economically devastating. Um, and I also believe that the human will is difficult to break. And, and you know, um, history has taught us that anything is possible. And now I joke around about the marijuana multiverse, but it's dope. You want to hear some funny? So I watched uh, the new Spider-Man cartoon into the across the multiverse, into the Spider-Verse. Like okay. there's, two of, there's two of them. Have you seen any of them? I haven't yet. Okay. And normally I don't watch cartoons and stuff, man, but like the animation style, especially on this latest one is really fresh and talks about, you know, different realities and it's stuff that you could read in like Eastern philosophy where basically, and stuff I've read in books where every act of kindness, you know, everything we do in this life, um, affects our future, affects our reality, you know, and we create our reality. And, um, <clears throat> in this multiverse, you know, guys like Jackson, like yourself, um, guys like me have taken it upon ourselves to like exist in this world that used to be totally underground. And now legalization has brought it to the foreground. Um, and you know, I just want to say thank you for having the disposition that you do, you know, the mind that you do, because I do believe that, you know, as I continue to learn from you, this is an example of a mindset that is good for our future, you know? Um, and just like when there's these hostile takeovers of countries and they burn books and want to erase knowledge, you know, I think that's what's at stake with legalization is their desire, that corporate desire to wash away what was and to build a new in typical colonial fashion. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're here because you're you're adept with with the plant. Um, you have a strong relationship with the plant. And before we explore more about breeding, your breeding and and these strains that are um, you know, you've just released recently. One, I'd love to know the first strain that you felt good about, you know, represents you as opposed to your first crossing back in 98 when you started breeding. And then also, um, <clears throat> how would you put into words your love for this plant? Um, well, Athena Kush would be, I mentioned before too, would be like the first thing I like crossed that like kind of brought me on this path and it came out the the resulting generations were so beautiful um and then i eventually crossed it with the uh, bubba kush too actually that became the athena kush it was athena and then it was athena kush um and varieties came from that very strong gorgeous couldn't get powdery mildew um which was like an issue as more and more people were um growing a little more kushes and ogs at that time um so to make selections of things that couldn't get powdery mildew, I saw as a very useful thing, as well as being incredibly gorgeous cultivars. And that's something I can I continue with now and had a lot of uh, really nice uh, selections made last year in different varieties of um, varieties that seem to be pretty much powdery mildew invincible because I do everything I can to, to see if they can get it. Like I, I'm growing them in the, in the wet you know, shade and I pack them together with other plants with powdery mildew. I try as hard to get powdery mildew and as much of it onto <laughs> different plants. And so the ones that shine through then, uh, yeah, I know something. I made about 10 different selections of about, of a few invincible varieties this year. <laughs> I <laughs> but, fucking yeah. love it. PM, PM farmer over here. Yeah. No, I, I, so Jackson, oh my God, one time for the Emerald Cup, uh, we were we were writing our bios and oh God, I wish I remembered his perfectly, but it was like something about being some shady Mendo dope boy from the hills or something. And then I was like, oh fuck, I got to get on that level too. So I wrote my bio as um, Bio Vortex is a delusional conceptual artist who grows moldy seeded weed on the coast. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so <laughs> funny, dude. Now what's, what's, what's funny is when you use the word invincible, 
like uh it brings me back to like watching a cartoon or reading a comic book where it's like i'm invincible and now that i really think about it uh the last time i heard that word used was when i interviewed in this context when i interviewed frenchy cannoli at the 2019 emerald cup and you can watch it on the youtube channel but he says it's first uh, was it the first i think it might have been the first time i met him but uh i was getting high as shit and he was saying how i asked him about his relationship with hash and he's like well when I smoke hash, I feel like I'm invincible. Like there's this bubble around me that nothing can hurt me. And and I'll never forget it. And if you do watch it, you'll see the funny reaction on my face. Like I'm like, huh? What the heck? Because again, before 2019, it was just my relationship was I, I can grow some good weed indoor and you know and so forth. But as far as culture and like really connecting with people and going to events and stuff like that, not not really my experience yet in life. So uh, I think that's awesome, dude. Because that's that that's um that's a huge accomplishment, man, and that's of high value to have a PM invincible plant. Uh, and would you say it's fair to say when you say that word, I don't think you use it lightly. No, no, it's actually yeah, as tested as it can be in the way I um yeah they they really have to stand up to it because uh yeah the level of the humidity and the fact that I do everything I can to try to make sure they are exposed to lots of powdery mildew, <laughs> probably <laughs> multiple different varieties of too. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I think it's hilarious, dude. I think it's awesome. It's for seeds, not for flowers. Right. Yeah. But <laughs> no, um, for sure, dude, for sure. And you know, you living in Trinidad, it's so beautiful there, man. And like you're saying, it's always foggy. It's always humid and like this wet kind of environment. And so I know you probably live there because of the natural beauty, but uh, was it also tactical in terms of it's also ideal for what you're doing? Um, I mean, I definitely love being uh, in the redwoods and the beach and, and the place where also the conifers uh, grow so many amazing mushrooms and seeing where the rocks, you know, where, where we enter the Pacific Ocean, where the forest connects, where the rivers come in. There's an energy here that's, like nowhere else so um yeah i think it was 96 97 i first came here and was on the beach and i knew that that was home that's so cool bro you know it's but, funny yeah it, i do get to use it as a tool as well in in breeding of course uh it's really nice growing there a little bit in a more conducive environment but um i've also got pretty good at just growing just the slightest bit away from the coast and still having some good results um by making uh choices of what's being grown how and what for uh and really thinking about the environment um before you know it's not just grow this one thing for for money it's like understand that environment and what's going to work there and how you can best um, utilize that were you born in 80 i was born in 1980 yeah <laughs> me too man uh, oh, yeah. i was born in october what month are you born in uh march march very cool yeah. so back it was like i think 99 it wasn't 98 when i went to humble for the first time yeah i don't think it was 98 dude uh, to pick up a pound through a friend who's going to Humboldt State University. Uh, and the chick he was dating knew Kevin. And eventually I met Kevin through that activity. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I remember because it was up in, in the northern part, you know, Arcata, Eureka, Arcata. And uh, I remember it was all new to me, right? Like you're saying, it's natural beauty. And I've been to Trinidad a couple times and it's paradise. Like you're saying, it's so beautiful, dude. And I think it's so cool that we we ventured from the Bay Area around the same time. You stayed. I didn't for sure. And like um, I see you as a not as a result of that experience because you existed before then. But it's had it, as we all know, Humboldt has this beautiful influence on anyone who leaves themselves vulnerable to it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different sides to Humboldt. Um, That's some true. are gorgeous. and some a little less uh and i think the little less comes from um a pretty dark history uh based around genocide and um you know a lot of the land and the way it was passed down um 
you know, came from that, that theft and that genocide. And I think there's darkness behind that, that, uh, continues today, but the incredible natural beauty of this area and the energy, I think is something that, uh, really a lot of people, um, can gain from, and it, it helps bring out, um, yeah, beauty in people when they connect in that way. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point. I have a book about the history of Humboldt. I haven't read it yet. And it talks about the first settler settler days. And you bring up a good point in that, uh, you know, a lot of the friends that we have or, you know, community members that are, you know, um, pro cannabis, you can say, for lack of a better word, they got their land in the Emerald Triangle and Humboldt from like what used to be these giant privately held and they were like 40 acres, 40 acres. And those could be subdivided. I'm sorry. A lot of logging land and yeah, subdivisions. Yeah. So, are you saying? And I'm uh, maybe you're uh, hopefully more educated uh, just for the sake of the conversation. But uh, about this, but I'm saying you bring up a valid point that from that trauma, uh, traumatic is an understatement, but from the genocide that happened, uh, uh, the people that did that, they they now held the land, and that land became logging land or you know do you know about the specifics like that um i mean there'd be a lot of specifics to go through i'm sure um there are i'm not going to name any names but there are specific families that certainly um got their land from some of the extreme massacres that happened there was um some that were planned there was one night where um three uh villages were massacred all the women and children all at the same time um and land grabs after that and um yeah and ranchers and loggers and things like that got to get their land in in that horrific way um but and you're saying also, that these families are still around today i mean of course i mean same with slave owners and all of that like yeah that that uh you know and it, no fault to the people that were born into those families. And I'm sure there's a lot of good people who steward their land now from that, but you know, it came from a, a dark place um, at that time, at least. And um, yeah, should, should be acknowledged. Um, but from then, uh, you know, there was these economic thefts and um, I think the Pacific lumber is a, a really important one to look at, too, and Charles Hurwitz and what happened with the cutting down of, of uh, a lot of the old growth. Even um, later, you know, a lot of this happened quite some, t you know, 100 years ago, but a lot of it happened also like 70s and 80s and uh, 90s. And it was happening when I first came up here. It was like the headwaters were being logged and they were bought with junk bonds. You know, it was it was basically like thieves and frauds and shysters stealing uh, w one of the most important world's resources and getting to get all of the benefit while the entire community and the entire world has 99 percent of the most one of the most important forest systems outside of like the Amazon, like just completely destroyed. And <clears throat> I'm really enjoying this conversation because when we talk about global warming, it's like in some cases there may be there may be an air of mystery. Well, exactly. How did we get here? And yeah, we know it's pollution. But when it comes to like who done it, who did it, you don't really see. So it's like it's like the thought dissipates into thin air. It's like you have amnesia or something. And like you're saying, we can we can we now know that we can point in this direction. Be like, you motherfuckers did this shit, dude. Yeah, but what's more important is is stop doing harm. Um, you know, with with remediation, uh, we find that natural systems want to regenerate and heal themselves. But the way to do that is to stop doing harm. And we're talking about uh, climate change and global warming and all of these issues. And we're talking about oh, we need more clean energy and electric cars and all this shit that actually. Uh, is all comes from very extractive methods like where do the solar panels come from they come from mining and shipping things all around and using a hell of a lot of petrochemicals to do that where do electric cars come from they come from freaking having battery systems that need lithium they need cobalt and the blood that is happening in the congo from cobalt mining and the horrific human trafficking and the environmental destruction is happening right now and you drive around in tesla or something and think that 
that's helping and it, it's not the impact of building that car is actually probably worse than just getting a, a older efficient car um but i think the most important thing is to stop the deforestation of the Amazon at this moment, which is happening um, big time. And uh, it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, we see a lot of violence on the native uh, communities in those areas who are uh, voices for probably the most important thing, uh, keeping us alive on this planet. And that is the carbon drawdown of the Amazon in that system. Um, so uh, before we talk about anything else, we need to stop deforestation of our rainforests 100 percent, man dude yeah man this is this is so important so so and important in the, the film tending the garden um that uh goes into three different farms that are engaged in um regenerative farming and the way they grow cannabis and food um they're beautiful families that are growing kids um you, you would it, it addresses that extractive model and um and how so much of what we do goes down that path um and in some ways cannabis was but wanted to show these beautiful families who are, are doing it the way we all need to be doing it as far as creating community localized food giving back to the earth um while growing a medicinal plant um but at the end uh in, i have the the quote of um you know technology is not gonna save us from you know this total ecological collapse um but the solutions are right in front of us and always have been and you know the future as was the past is regenerative and it ends with the amazon forest um and that's not a mistake no. awesome man damn this is so cool uh such a powerful conversation i i'm gonna go get that cup of water real quick uh because i want to take a i'm gonna smoke more weed but i should drink some water um uh, while i come right back uh could you please share with the audience you know i just got back from pakistan it was freaking awesome and it sounds like you've also traveled to some cool places around the world if you could share a little bit about that and its influence on you i'll be i'll be right back i see like a minute maybe a minute and a half like a minute <laughs> how about i get a glass of water too if that's okay yeah 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 for sure we for sure every yeah, audience we'll, we'll, we'll be back we'll be back in like one minute dude thanks for take a cool. smoke break guys we'll be right back All right, man. <clears throat> Just will be back in a second. Perfect there he timing. is. Look at the timing. Look at the synchronicity. Yeah, dude. Awesome. All right, let me get a sip in. <laughs> yeah, please share with us about uh, your global travels and their influences on you, sir. I kind of want to hear about yours first, but um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm very thankful for the plant and the connections that it's made. I, I'm not somebody who I feel uncomfortable with the idea of tourism or vacations or going to a place in that kind of mentality. Um, it's upsetting and um, to me to be feel separate from a place or to observe a place from a privileged perspective. Like I can't go to some stupid fucking hotel and watch in and go do vacation stuff and not like experience a place in the way that it is. So um, I think that the way cannabis has allowed me to travel is a way where um, because of the work that I do and the connections that I've made with people, people have uh, 
been so kind to me and opened their homes and shown me their uh, their lives, their work, taking me to all the different places and connecting in a real way to the places that I go. And so much of that is, is actually through cannabis and through seeds. And um, so I see like that is another way that I get to be a pollinator, spreading seeds and connections and uh, understanding places and ideas. And I, I don't want to observe a place. I want to I want to be a part of it when I go somewhere. And it's the connection with beautiful people um, that starts with cannabis so often that it's allowed for that. So I'm thankful for that. The plant and all the people that have done that. And I know you just experienced that. And so I kind of can you can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Because um, yeah. yeah, mad love for for land race uh, genetics, um, and uh, you know I've I've got the pleasure to to meet and hang out with uh, that crew too um, in the UK and Spain and stuff. But um, yeah, t- tell us how that happened and and uh, yeah, the amazing people you're hanging with. No, definitely, Jesse. Uh, two things I want to confess. Uh, first one is that uh, when, when we went to the UK and Landrace Genetics sponsored that, I was supposed to bring back uh, the mango seeds, but I, I fr- freaking just forgot them like last minute. So it's my fault you didn't get those seeds because I'm sure he may have mentioned something about that. And then secondly, when you talk about your level of connection and um, your awareness of, of that so you can achieve it when you travel – um, I think of myself, I, th- I think I thought to myself, you know, like, wow, this is a rich person here. You know, when we talk about, yeah, man, I have a, I have a rich life to me. It doesn't mean money. You know, to me, it means the quality of your relationships and, and so much more. Um, and what I wanted to share with you just, uh, I've never shared this before and it's on a live and it's all good. I think like part of my, uh, trauma or part of my like fucked up shit growing up and even now dude and i'm working on it is like uh i'm a totally nice guy totally am you know what i'm saying and when i start getting close to people like close it's like i have this tendency to like distance myself because i feel it's like i feel safer with that buffer zone you know and i think it came from just not having um, the closest relationship, like, you know, just kind of growing up feeling alone or just being, I sequestered myself, you know, reading books and shit. But like, uh, you know, I never grew up like talking about what I was going through with my parents and shit like that. And so like, I really admire you for, uh, you know, going out there making these connections because that's exactly what made my experience in Pakistan so rich. And you're going to laugh your ass off. But because I, because I was in the boys <laughs> because I was in the Boy Scouts growing up, it gave me an experience as a boy uh, to be you know really positive, work as a team, be around other kids your age, and get to interact in a in a cool way besides like school. Um, I did piano shit like that and like figure skating, but that shit's all like solo shit, right? So uh, I grew up going to Christian school, private school. And so I, I went like the opposite direction, man. Like I was, I was supposed to be like normal, you know, going to uh, college, wife and kids, all this stuff. But uh, my point is, is, um, you know, talking about Pakistan, I felt like it was the Boy Scouts for adults because, you know, my memory of the Boy Scouts was healthy, like healthy, as you can imagine, a lot of your experiences growing up with the community, you know, totally feel safe, you feel you feel good. You're like, it's super positive. And, and that stemmed from the way that we were hosted. And I've never been to a Muslim country. We've all experienced Islamophobia as what, as what you're saying, you know, the separatism as an ideology. And, um, it really moved me and it's something that I'll never forget. And it's a gift that, uh, uh, has, has, has like, it's, it's in my heart, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's crazy, man. It's like a gesture that somebody can give you that, uh, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed at, at like the gifts you can receive in this life, you know? And I never thought it would affect me in this way, but, uh, you know, when it comes to homophobia, we think, you know, danger and, and, and violent dispositions and, and all kinds of political agenda bullshit. And from the moment we stepped off the plane in Pakistan, bro, we were like when you go to Hawaii, they give you a lay of of flowers around your neck. These were roses around our necks, and I received a bouquet of flowers. And I, I, I was on camera. I don't know if you 
maybe you've seen the, one of the posts, but I was like, I don't know what's happening right now. You know, who's getting married? I feel like I'm getting married. Like, you know, like what the hell? And, you know, these guys uh, treat us like brothers, you know? Um, I feel like the Islamic religion. Um, okay, I'll, this is what I'll say. This is exactly what I'm going to say right now. And I think you have a mind to appreciate it. I think of Christianity in America and going to Christian school, I had friends, their parents were pastors. They had big houses, fancy suits, fucking expensive cars, Yukon Denali's, the Cadillac SUVs. And when you think of Jesus in the Bible, is like this humble guy, you know, humble, humble. And so there's this hypocrisy. It doesn't I think of the up. guy who said it's easier for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. Or it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. No, 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 100%. And, and like there's this – um, uh, the Western world and in religion is this incredible, blatant, unabashed hypocrisy that is like socially acceptable. And then you go to a country like Pakistan and uh, you literally feel in some ways like you've stepped back in time to the bi biblical era because you're driving and you see real shepherds. They're not actors, dude. They're real shepherds that have like, that's their lifestyle but from their parents and grandparents and great grandparents and they have their flock of sheep and they're walking down the same road as you're driving down. Uh, and it's when you go to the mosque and you pray, you know, you put your head to the floor, your knees. And it's like, that's how in the old times people would pray to, to the gods or, you know, your higher power and so forth. Um, so what I'm saying is that there was a lot of uh, mm -hmm. synchronicity and like, it wasn't like, they were putting on a show for us. It wasn't like this was fabricated for us. It wasn't like this was for the sake of them getting something out of us. This was a genuine, as you've experienced, we're opening our doors, our homes, our hearts. And um, we're doing this because we love our country so much. We love, we have such a great pride of where we're from. And there was this unspoken thing that I, that I understand that and I think it was the vision of land race genetics because one day, Jesse, one day we went to Hopper Valley to go to the plants, see the plants. And I'll talk about that. <clears throat> and then the second time I was the only one to go to Thita because it was dangerous, man. It wasn't unstable. And we had to talk about that the day before that we'd be going at our own risk. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, you know, having being able to reflect on the experience, uh, uh it totally defeated that stigma of Islamophobia and it provided such a rich connection and brotherhood, um, which just like a seed needs um, the right environment to thrive. You know, the future of our global culture and this plant, the seeds have been planted. I feel like in this humble way, in this, in the way that we did, you know, with a, a, our Muslim brothers and us as Westerners, and I made it a point, and what made this special is that I took this seriously. I was the first one to say yes to go to Pakistan, five years of them asking various people. And that's why we went to Pakistan. And this happened because Rolf and I, uh, John wasn't with us at the time. We said, dude, let's, I was thinking global cannabis culture. I want to go global. Let's, let's, let's come out of our pockets to, go to, pockets to go to Barcelona. Fuck it. And we did. And out of a 10-minute interaction with Land Race Genetics, um, you know, this, this new reality uh, that, that we're talking about has occurred from that. Um, and what am I getting to is that, um, I, I went to the mosque before traveling so that I can ha have respect. I didn't know what to expect, but I just knew that if I can show respect and I can come in, not being ignorant, knowing something like I'll be all right, you know, cause I had this in my heart. I was like, dude, I want want to go connect with Pashtun Afghani brothers because everything I grew up hearing about the war in Afghanistan and, and Thida borders Afghanistan, you know? Um, and so I did in Fremont and out of all the Westerners that were in the group, I took it upon myself to be that leader, to be that bridge, to, to, to build that bond. You know, it's like, you want to have a friendship with somebody. It's like, somebody has got to take the first step, you know, you gotta, you know what I'm saying? And, and so like, I, I'm really proud of, of what we did and it wasn't cause of me, man, it was all of them. And I was just, I think, encouraging, um, our guys in different ways and everybody had a great time and did their part. Things that made us feel uncomfortable and you're going to laugh, dude, but like in the Muslim country, there's no women, bro. It's all separate, you know? So the whole time we're with dudes and they treat us so well, it was, 
it was they, they were the ones that were making sure uh, if we needed more to eat and we had we had everything we needed, like kind of like a motherly kind of thing. It was hilarious. And at the same time, when the musicians come and you dance, it's with men, right? And I'm not used to doing the Arabic or the, you know, Pakistan dance moves, um, but it's all traditional. It's all super traditional and it's it's beautiful. I, I love it, dude. Um, and I was insecure at first and then we, we got to it and it's all good. Um, so uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I feel that since I had a near-death experience in 2016, getting shot point blank in the chest, delivering 500 bucks of weed during 215 days when I had my delivery service, Green Walrus. $500. Um, yeah, dude. It's, I, I'm, you know, I have a scar from here to here, you know. Folks in the audience may have seen it. But uh, nonetheless, it's like uh, I've had a much stronger spiritual connection since then. And my life has changed in many ways since then. And when we study mysticism, spiritualism, and even like psychedelics, you often find that in different ways you can have like a near-death experience. Um, and that uh, results in enlightenment, so to speak. Uh, and so with me... Um, I'm trusting more and more in in the goddess, which to me is like the plant energy. You know, I feel that she wanted me to go to Pakistan and that the reason I went was to, we went, was to create a documentary that's going to show such a positive light on an Islamic hash farmers and the culture in that whole world. I, I was humbled. I almost cried like in the mountains. Um, you're at these high altitudes and you know, you may have seen some of these pictures, but like the, the Himalayan mountains, the Karakoram mountains to be exact is where we were up in Hunza, Gilgit, Baltistan. And uh, you know, just the pristine, you feel like you're close to God. You feel like you're looking at God. It's hard to put into words. And I'm sure you may have had similar experiences, but um, I'm indebted to land race genetics for the rest of my life. And they've, they've earned my, not just respect of course, but like loyalty in different ways. And, and and so if I were to host you at my house, what I learned is like I it, I can make your experience so much more beautiful by treating you like a guest, you know, and, and it's something you'll never forget. Um, so thanks for listening, man. And, you know, I hope I've answered some of your I can I can keep going. You know, the plants, you probably want to know about the plants, um, the stalks on these plants in Hopper are like when you look at a pumpkin and that knot that comes off the pumpkin, it's like really, really just like. I would say they exhibit these qualities like hulk, hulking, like just really, that's the best way I can put it. And the same texture of the pumpkin, rough, it's like, it, it's something that I'm not used to seeing. And, and I have not seen as many outdoor plants as you have. I've seen a, a decent amount. And uh, I'm sure somebody like you would really appreciate it. And the terp profile, we found different ones, but the one that struck me the most was like a mango profile. And uh, going to Tira, I think what you would have appreciated a lot was the fact that these are areas that historically have been making hash, you know, for generations. And you see in the agriculture style, when you step into the earth, how your foot sinks, it's like, damn, dude, this is cool. This is like traditional. And and they do it in this. And you know what's crazy is the same, um, like, uh, and many times it's humble, humble people uh meaning not coming from money are the ones that are um uh pursuing a direction in cannabis like you know we, we weren't we didn't have much economically going on here but now we started growing weed in the mountains and we made a future for ourselves you know logging came and went fishing etc and in these areas it's the same thing where there's no education there's no infrastructure um these are areas that they govern themselves and what i'll say is that um some a part of me wants to be careful about what I say, and the other part of me wants to say fuck it. But as you know, this the U.S. military has been involved in so much shit out in that part of the world, and where Thida is is boring Afghanistan. And so when we talk about insurgents and all the shit that happens and it not being safe, there's different theories as to what's really going on. But for that reason, that they couldn't guarantee our safety, I was the only one that went, dude. But and and I felt at peace, Jesse. I felt at peace. I felt like this is. I'm supposed to go. I'm like, if they're going to go, I should try to go. So they took two cars because in case I got caught at a military checkpoint as an American, they can drive me back, you know? But they dressed me up as a Pashtun man. They told me not to speak English at the checkpoints. I stared at my shoes each time. We got lucky. We made it all the way across. We had two SSG commandos with us that were, you know, dressed normally. And they knew because they know 
military shit, you, you know, people and stuff and how it works. So they really eased our way to get in. And we had to leave after 30 minutes because it's like people started to realize that there's foreigners in the area and shit. And I got a rare eight minute interview that's on, on the page. But uh, I think like it was an honor to, to have that experience. And I feel like I did it on behalf of, of our community, you know, and to be able to share it. Um, so it's just amazing, bro. Like you, I can it's just in the plants. It, it's, it's wild. It's like, I think you'd be in heaven in that. What I, when I talked to Jackson, it's like, he talked about being able to recreate the strains that we've enjoyed so much without the negative characteristics that are attached to them, rediscovering shit, you know, and maybe there's that potential. Kevin can gift you some seed, dude, if you're interested. And I have seed as well, not from this expedition. Um, Kevin's got those for me, um, but from previous ones that Landris Genetics has given me. Yeah, I have some from him from uh, way back when we first met and stuff. Um, but uh, actually, I, I was invited on a similar trip, but it was before COVID. And so that kind of didn't happen. So it was pretty amazing to see you guys do it because that was uh, I was very um, honored for that that offer. And um, yeah, you, you say that they did it all, but uh, I have to give it up to you for taking that step and doing it with an open heart and dropping fear and the bravery of vulnerability and um, and the give and and take um of connection between friends through this plant and um the sharing of of ideas of cultures and of yourselves thank you jesse and if anything i got to give a big shout out and a lot of love to the people of pakistan because no no we weren't shown any kind of aggression or like you know, we didn't get spit on because we're American. It was the opposite, dude. People wanted to practice their English and they really were happy to see us, just strangers. And the last thing I'll say to give you an idea of, of the energy was that literally, dude, all these guys went with us to the airport. We were rolling like 20 deep the whole time, uh, 20, 25 deep. And they all, some of them started to tear up, you know, when they said goodbye to us from the airport, you know? So that is something I'll never forget. And, 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 it just class, man, coming from a cultures, you know, individuals that come from a culture that predates America. And to summarize, we got so much to learn from the world around us, you know, and I think I'm just new to the, to this party because you traveling the way that you do, you're able to soak up so much more. It's like every time you do your thing, you kind of get that experience, I think. Yeah, I, I can't do it any other way. It make me very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I think one of the things to really gain from you know the, your experience and i hope other people do from from what you've shared is just how dangerous um propaganda is in media and also from other places from education religion sometimes too but the the media is um is something to be very mindful anytime something seems like propaganda or it's teaching fear or hate uh <laughs> You don't want that that's a mind killer and um it has so much to do with everything that's um gone wrong um and so yeah going into things open heart with love with giving and and without that that fear that was created um for sinister reasons uh, i think is 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 really Im important um yeah, it's it's pretty sad the 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 shallow and fear based concepts that have been entrenched in a lot of people when it comes to others. Um, I would say it actually even goes into um, the garden too. Uh, I look at these ads and stuff from. Uh, well actually it's even to today but like this this concept i was looking at this one i think it was from the 70s about like killing dandelions in your yard and stuff it's like it's like oh you spray a poison on the dandelion to make your lawn look perfect because it creates this anxiety that your lawn is not that good if you have a flower growing from it and and dandelions are medicinal you could use the roots as food they attract native pollinators they're a biodynamic prep and there's this concept that they are ruining your lawn, you know, and this is something to deal with, with poison and also uh, pests in 
the garden. Liz uh, from Green Source Gardens, I, I, in one of the regenerative cannabis farming calendars I did, had a quote where about um, not seeing anything as a pest, that that's a concept <laughs> that they don't uh, take in, that all life and all the bugs are, you know, could be a friend and someone who deserves your support. And it's really an unbalanced system is the issue and growing out of balance or doing things out of balance or not doing things with love or open heart or, you know, seeing life as for the beauty that it is and that it, we are all connected. Um, we, you know, it's one universe. We are all part of the same thing and we should treat everyone as such and we have so much to learn from each other and remember from each other and you bring up a good point here sir um this four letter word which i think is so cool it's love and i think my experience growing up with like a feeling like i had a lack of it in different ways led me to kind of like self-destructive you could say dangerous kind of behavior you know selling weed on the street etc and then um now that I'm discovering about love in such a beautiful way, um, and I have to give credit to Ayana at Humble Synchronicity Trees for showing me so much of like hippie love culture and even little things like getting hugs, bro, like getting hugged and being able to give hugs and shit like that. Um, I think that uh, it's like green, Nick at Green Source, um, you know, Jackson, and just as a rule of thumb, it's like that love um, for what you're doing is really like a magic ingredient for breeding. And then it's really dangerous. And I say dangerous in the context of to the status quo. Mm. Uh, when it's like you're taking notes and you're like, you know, developing your skills and you become like a, not maybe like an alchemist, but manifesting. And mm. I feel like guys like you and Nick and Jackson, even though I got to be honest, I'm a little mad at myself. Um, I haven't explicitly tr explicitly tried flowers of what you what you do. You know, I think I've had crosses thereof. Yeah, but I but I see who you run with, and I see, and I just have this intuition. So I know it's it's super dank. I know it. I know it. Um, but I'm saying like, uh, when it comes to breeding and 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 this love that you have for the plant. Can you please put that into words? I don't think we've covered that yet, right? Your love for the plant, putting it into words? Yeah, you know, you actually did a good job with it. I was just about to actually make that point, too. You know, people ask, you know, what best advice is for growing or for breeding or for really doing anything. Um, and for me, it's to do it with love. You know, if, if you really want to grow dang flowers, you do it with love. And a lot of times, actually, and... You know, I definitely see it happen because you go through different cycles. But like when you're more neglectful or distracted or not doing something with that, uh, you know, focus and intent towards love and plants, then you, the, the plants I see, you know, um, they suffer from that, you know. But sometimes it's not even anything that you gave them or did. I mean, providing a good environment is, is a loving act. and But um, there actually truly is something about just watching and loving a plant going out and looking at them with a cup of coffee and being like, you are so pretty that, um, really has a big effect. And also just like, why are you doing something? And if it's not for the love of it, then the fuck's the point, you know? And when you have a, a, a near life, uh, experience, then that kind of thing becomes more cemented because every day is a gift. And so it's like, if you're just doing something for a shallow reason, like money or power or, you know, cloud or, uh, base concepts, um, then, you know, when, when you have some of these experiences, just the, um, the stupidity of that becomes very, uh, blatant. 100% and a hundred percent. And what I think is really cool is like the way I like to think is like upside down. So there's this concept I don't agree with. And so, and so forth. It's like, it's hard to put into words, but turning it upside down. And uh, you're saying, uh, you said uh, this gift of life and, and being aware and so forth is uh, yeah. When I first started selling weed, it was that like money equals power equals coolness equals, you know, I'll attract the right 
I'll attract a cool chick that thinks I'm cool because I got all this shit. When in fact, it was a chick that just wanted to smoke my weed and knew that I was growing and ended up being the reason why my spot was getting broken into and craziness, man. Uh, and but money uh, should hopefully just, you know, like you do need to have things come back in so you can continue, so you can exist and pay bills and do your projects. But for me, it really should be about being able to continue the things that you love, you know, being able to support that sustainably or regeneratively through a system that keeps giving back. And if you do something with love, hopefully the community loves it too. And you can find ways to, to continue that. But if the end goal is just money, that's pretty sad. And it's, it's, we've seen what it's done um, to our planet. Like the idea of corporations that are just there to make profit for shareholders. I think that's the stupidest idea that's ever happened. Like, why would you build anything for that reason? It's just to build something to take and then divide it up among a bunch of assholes. It, that makes no sense to me. But like, if you build a company and you build something that you care about and love and want to have an impact and create something that uh, is useful for the earth, as a lot of people, a lot of smart and uh, amazing people do, but also work inside this um, sick system, um, that like really shouldn't you just be building shouldn't all companies kind of be non-profit shouldn't everything be about building something better for the next uh day for the next year for the next future for all of your employees to do better like the point for a company to be successful should be that you continue doing the work that you love and the people that help you do that get to be brought up and that you offer something that brings something to other people otherwise what's the point and the, you know i think there's more of that concept starting to happen and these B corporation, that kind of thought, but a lot of it's greenwashed and, and um, half-assed thought of, but I think like if that's, that should be the core of why you do something. You are doing it because you love it. You want to do it and you want to give back and you should be growing that thing, not trying to make some concept of profit to divide up among assholes. <clears throat> no, hundred percent dude. And I think for some of us, it's like, learning how to get to that place, you know, and it's so cool. Uh, this example that's set um, through breeding of doing what you love. And again, maybe I'm asking for too much, but when I asked you about your love for the plant, um, you mentioned spending time with it, um, telling it it's beautiful. Um, well, also, I like to avoid the word it when talking about living beings. It's hard because you want to say, you know, both represent male oh, her, and female. Like living with her or him? Well, it could be her or him. Yeah, so that, then it gets hard. And, and, and the, I guess I want to point out there's like issues with our language and the fact that like we have to use they when that's like kind of plural and stuff. Like why don't we have a good word that honors uh, a living entity with both male and female like aspects? But um, anyway, the way we identify something has everything to do with how we end up treating and I don't want to say it, but the thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. the and thing is also another issue too, you know, but I understand um, fully. Yeah. Living, living beings. Um, you know, you don't call your grandmother it, right. right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, so yeah, I get it. I do do that with, uh, other living things too. Um, and it's a lot of times because, because we're talking about both the male and female plant at times, but, uh, in general, I just being aware of that, I think is, is the key. Uh, we're going to use it sometimes, but uh, being thoughtful about how you identify things, I think is another way to share love with other living things. Yeah. I like using the term goddess. I definitely use the term her. I'm not around a lot of males, so I never really, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, so you have been breeding some cool stuff that, if it was a sham, if it was BS, if you were like a Hollywood actor or something, like Nick wouldn't be your homie at Green Source. Jackson would distance distance himself far from you, you know. Um, but what I keep on hearing is this black dog, dude. It seems like you you do a lot of work with this black dog. Is that right? Yeah, it's been a it's been quite the a flagship. Um yeah, and you know, people like Nick and, and Jackson and uh, a lot of other amazing breeders um yeah daniel heart rock mountain uh jason equilibrium just a lot of people the fact that they uh 
love working with the varieties that I've shared with them and, and seeing, you know, what Nick and Liz at Green Source have done over the years from the, the very t- first time we met, I think 2015, you know, we exchanged seeds and I mean, he's brought varieties to F9 or above that I'd shared with them. And like, that's, you know, a decade of work that you've put into something that was a gift. And then every year we exchange and, and I see so much of varieties that I've worked on in a lot of people's um, breeding stock. And uh, I, it's a great honor to know I, I that um, people that I respect want to continue with that work. and. Um, and I think that there is a, yeah, a love, uh, an authenticity, and something that's real in that. That there's a connecting force, and I think that the people who see cannabis as something to as a, as a mutualistic organism to evolve with, uh, I'm, I'm attracted to those kinds of minds, and um, they certainly turn out to be the best breeders quite often. So cool, dude. <clears throat> yes, there's nothing wrong with creating your own vocabulary, evolving the English English language. And it seems like industry, like the internet, uh, well, there's slang and it's not ex- exclusive to that. But as a cannabis community, I think that we can make our forefathers and mothers proud by, and you're you're living and breathing it. I'm really enjoying this conversation for everything that you're saying. I think it really embodies the spirit of what started all of this, you know? Uh, and for that to be able to thrive, I think that's like the secret weapon that can't be controlled, can't be taxed or regulated when you're able to shift people's perceptions of things. And now the world's different, man. And and they say it can't happen, but I'm starting to believe, dude. No reason so. not to, to believe and, and work towards something. Um, but we can be realistic in the, uh, as we do work towards something with, uh, out fear and love in our hearts, but we can be realistic in the issues that are there. Um, but, uh, not to ignore the black dog question too. Yeah. Yes. yeah thank uh, you. You're out of mind. Black, yep. <laughs> black dog has been, a, uh, an amazing plant for so much connection. And, and that's maybe one of the plants that's brought me around, uh, to so many different places and connected me with a lot of people. Um, also Nick had been breeding that since the first time we met too and that went into a lot of different varieties um but uh yeah with humboldt seed organization you know i was bringing me out to spain was working with dina fem we put it out to the world like that so all of a sudden i get to see black dog grown in like 50 different countries what is black dog that which is that's awesome like 50 different yeah. countries that's crazy dude. <laughs> yeah it's wild wow. and so many places i've gone like out in the middle i was out in like columbia and like i went across this like crazy um uh river in a in a cable car to this like um this this eco retreat thing that was like out there and they did all these kinds of like they did aquaponics and they had um animals and a lot of history too that they had through murals in the war and on their some of the old buildings that they had and um but they they because they're way out there remote that they they created their own food so they even had tilapia growing and growing uh lettuce out of that and everything and um had and was brought out there by a friend and um as we're like talking and uh spanish isn't that great their english but we got to really connect through cannabis and um they started showing me pictures and they were growing black dog there the year before i was like out in the you know way out there it's like had no idea who they were and like they were growing black dog out there and i've had that happen in a lot of different places um but is it because excuse me you're connecting with people that you know through the game is that they like they knew that was a pure coincidence that was a uh, pure coincidence yeah what the <laughs> hell damn yeah. That happens a lot, actually. But my, yeah, the seeds have got out there in a lot of different ways, and so it's pretty. And I love just seeing things growing in all kinds of different places. You know, just like New Zealand, Australia, all over South America, all over Europe, um, Africa. Like people send me pictures from my varieties growing all over, and it's it's amazing to see how that happens. You know, it's like it's a pretty trippy thing to think about when you're in a little backyard and. Trinidad that like what's what's this seed gonna turn into what's gonna happen from this um yeah 
That is so wild. I had no idea it was like that for you, man. Um, what was I going to ask you? Yeah, so that's amazing. Um, what exactly is a black dog? Oh, yeah. Um, it's actually um, Blackberry Kush with an emerald headband. That emerald headband was California Sour Diesel. Uh, really nice selection. My buddy Ryan and Oli were growing out here in like... Um, uh, you know, 36 area for, for some time. And, um, that, uh, had the lemon Larry OG on that. And then that was put on to blackberry Kush. Blackberry Kush is like super fast and pretty, but not that potent and can flip really easy. Um, you know, like, uh, has some issues, but like, man, when that emerald headband went on it, like it had the certain structures and that speed of flowering time and that combo worked really good and there's something about the effects and flavor and just the gorgeous look of it um and then out in uh actually 36 yeah mad river area i was doing a, a pretty nice grow out there and was selecting through those seeds and they were all dank but just one like stood out so hard and i made a clone of it back in 2012 that i really loved um crossing with things and um it would just make the kind of structure I was looking for and resistance. And so I loved carrying over uh, flavors from other things. And I kind of used Black Dog as a project to actually like, you know, probably put several hundred different things, like different varieties around from, uh, you know, both clone selections and seeds from around the world over the years uh, onto Black Dog. So it's kind of like a neat, uh, interesting way of uh storing um genetic information in this one cultivar too so having like you know several hundred uh crosses of black dog is is really really neat and i can use that as a, a toolbox to work with um a lot of other things that i might be interested in so the black dog is a clone from 2012 2012 yep i still breed with it but you know i've i've, I've done multiple I mean, I've been breeding with it this whole time, so I have like very line bred. Um, I've done a lot of different back crosses versions with it too, and then you know, like Green Source has taken it, I think, to F nine at this point too. Uh, uh, well, no, I gave actually it was the BC four that then took several years on, so already it was a four level back cross before they started, and then they did lots of um, sibling uh, generations after that. Understood. Um... You know, the black dog must be really unique uh, in its terping profile. It must hit hard, I imagine, uh, for for Nick to, to incorporate it like he did and so forth. So please share with us, um, what's the dealio? Yeah, well, I mean, it's got a really lovely kind of berry and gas flavor. You get the pixie sticks. The hash it makes is really cool. I remember uh, one year, what was it? Might have been two thousand pixie sticks. Like the sugar, the pixie stick smell. Yeah, yeah, the purple pixie sticks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, dude. But like, I see it more in the hash. You know, uh, I remember Re Resin Ranch did one where it was straight pixie sticks, but I'd seen it like that a few times. Oh, two thousand sixteen, I remember. Um, yeah, I was doing a booth at the Emerald Cup, and it, it was the day after the Eagle Clash, and people were like, "Oh shit, Black Dog just won!" And it was like, some, some oh, sick. From Michigan, no, Jay Equilibrium. <laughs> shout out to Librium genetics yeah. um and uh yeah so that was cool i mean I, I don't really enter contests but i get to see so many of my varieties actually do pretty well in different mm -hmm. things around uh places but i don't i don't really participate in that way i just like to bring dink jars to share with to go through with the heads and and uh exchange uh exchange jars and smell each other's weed <laughs> <laughs> so uh if i were to smoke the black dog um uh, it'll get you whapped is it is it heavy um oh shit i'm having a it. yeah but the oh jesse will be right back dude i guarantee you that for sure man dude that black dog sounds so cool man thank you for everybody that's tuned in right now what a treat it is here in the marijuana multiverse connecting with all kinds of cool cool sorry the uh when i got that call it it did something with the mic so i could barely or, or the uh uh speaker so i could barely hear you but we're back this is not your clone right this is the real jesse um this is the bc5 f2 
<laughs> reporting for duty. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome, dude. Uh, okay, we're talking about the black dog, and I was asking you if if it'll give me a whopping. Like, uh, I like strong weed, you know. So I'm just wondering. yeah. Actually, um, it's more of a medium level THC potency, um, I've, and I've crossed it with all kinds of things that become stupid potent you know i've definitely there's a lot of black dog crosses that are as as potent as it gets but um but the the original black dog no is a, it's a little bit more of a, a balanced uh centered kind of high and it's more um i think some of the qualities of the effect are just like it's very connecting uh very good like kind of nature walk and paying attention and hanging out and very um like just kind of balanced positive kind of effects so it's not in a, an extreme i've never experienced anxiety from it and i've always uh experienced more kind of open to connection kind of uh effects from it um it's not like a over the top crazy terpy but it's very pleasing smell um you know like there's none of those extreme spikes of like you know like a well jack like the terpenaline is like insane there's no terpenaline or anything in it um or like you know, some things will just have insane limonene or mercine. There's a, there's a decent little amount of that too, but it's it's not these incredibly <laughs> like hard spikes. You know, it's a, it's it's a balanced a little bit of these things. Some of the crosses get a little bit of that awesomeine too, some some of that floral thing. Um, but what I've found is is just so many people who have actually had it help them in different ways, and uh, it's it's pretty wild getting uh, messages from people saying that it helped them kick opiates or and i've had that happen so actually like a stunning amount of times people have said it helped them get off opiates which um is very um it just yeah i mean i could cry thinking about helping somebody in that way through through seed work um and i've also uh just recently too somebody in canada was having a lot of medical issues saying that it's the thing that helped them helps them the most expect especially with um different extracts and, and medicines that they do from their own grows from it that that's been one of the most helpful for their own um uh, medical issues and pain management so um yeah it's not just like i'm not going to say it's the loudest strongest whatever but it has helped people and people have resonated with it and it's connected me with so many things and um so i it also black dog like works really good as a, a, a to be able to cross different varieties with because it gives structure and a lot of flavors blend really well with it you know like when i crossed the cherry lime pop from minji and the um with it like the way those flavors came through and balanced and that was just awesome because his stuff is just so terpy and strong and i love the way it blended together because you got that euphoric aspect from him but it got a little bit more balanced out with the the black dog and then um you know it also makes everything really stable uh, black dog is like one of the most female plants at this point the way that i breed it uh i've i've bred for um i, I mean i think a lot of the back crossing too brings out more and more uh female uh energy out of it and you, you know like i've never seen a female ever her male from a black dog um but the males have you know are frosty is all heck and like have almost feminine qualities to them um but so it's one that actually pretty much really helps stabilize anything that might have any kind of intersex traits so it works really well with a lot of uh, land race varieties or certain varieties that are just so yummy uh you know that you can't let them go even if they have something that's not a desirable trait that maybe maybe it can be helped out with black dog so uh for me it's a it's a very foundational breeding tool uh to a lot of my work awesome man so <clears throat> two things is the when if i were to say black dog out in the world would people automatically uh connotate to the pixie stick smell Hmm. Is that it? Um, it like I mean, I think I think a lot of people are going to share the berries and gas. Uh, I don't know if anyone like. I think, I, and and I think it gets brought out a little right. bit more and good hash to get that pixie stick smell. It's not always going to be from uh, you know smoking a joint, um, but it can. Um, but something about you know if you isolate the trichomes, then that can get brought out a bit more in it. Yeah, that's um, that's wild. And I'm trying to remember the next question that I was going to ask you. Um, 
uh the black dog uh also that was it was amazing to see it i, I did a black dog drop on alpine and um yeah. it was like minutes <laughs> that people just like completely because it hadn't been offered for a while since um humboldt and seed organization didn't have it available and so people have been growing it for all over the world and and there's a there is a big hunger for that so um i'm gonna have to uh yeah step it up and get it out there more for people <laughs> that's so cool and um uh when you made it did you realize that it had all these qualities about it or some of these things did you expect for it to resonate so well i mean when i'm standing in front of that gorgeous plant that i selected for it yeah i was like this is gonna i knew that that was gonna grow into something i had that like the way i like thought about that that cut and stuff like um yeah i something like the future affecting the present kind of thing. No, I felt it. Yeah, I felt it immediately. But um, also, uh, I don't, you know, nobody makes anything in a vacuum. You know, it's it's so much work. Uh, that, and, and things that have happened and the circumstance in the universe giving gifts and friends. And so, um, yeah, really, um, my dear friend Ryan, who's uh, one of the founders of Humboldt Cedar Organization, is, um, you know, pivotal in the existence of of that variety too it was the projects that we were doing that led to that and then after i had made that selection it was the projects that we did together that got it out to the world so mad mad love to to ryan and eric and humboldt seed organization and dean fm too wow, despite dude. the issues we've had uh and, and jesse it's it sounds like it's fairly easy to grow <laughs> yeah yeah it's one of the easiest plants to grow so many people like say that it's like oh this is the plant that i've got like so many messages about that actually recently too since the last drop there's like this is the plant that made me fall in love with growing um yeah it's just so easy it's it's pretty joy to grow and um fast flowering uh yeah some plants take some work but you don't have to do anything with black dog except give it a some good soil nice environment and some love it, it's uh, it, black dog has uh quite efficient too um and a lot of the varieties and the um the back cross versions of the the cherry lime dogs too that go back on the black dog are extremely efficient in their resource use so they don't need that much water they don't need much nutrition and they can just grow these incredibly chunky giant nugs with almost nothing um you know a great example of that is uh tina from moonmade farms when the fires hit out there you know she, she's growing the cherry moon which is one of the the back cross versions of, of black dog that I, I worked on and kind of went down a line specifically for her and she calls them cherry moon out there and um actually we just we just uh uh there's some artwork coming out for that rat king who also did this um yeah this mob hoodie that i'm wearing here too and here's the black dog right here based off of like some of my dogs from the past i had a lot of mastiffs and pit bulls and over the years and um, i'm a big lover of dogs but uh gmob stands for grown men on bikes um the amazing rat king one of the most talented tattoo artists and uh incredible colors and and skill um she kind of made the image we worked on this concept because uh it means um grown men on bikes is what gmob stands for uh if you're like you're in like Eureka or McKinleyville or certain spots you see like shady dude on a on a <laughs> grown man on a bike like you go like, oh look out for the G mob it's kind of a, a joke in the area so it's kind of a fun thing to to apply to it but because it's a hash variety and it was my banana uh SFV OG so you got the gas can um there we go over oh, backwards I see, it. I see it yeah we got the gas can we got the banana OG uh onto the black dog and then we got the garlic mushroom onion we got the vortex tattoo here little vortex is like hidden in the onion and all kinds of cool detail but um i love like that connecting of art and and <clears throat> genetic information and and jokes and fun and um along with the the breeding projects yeah um, dude. But, oh yes the, uh, a, a beautiful version of cherry moon oh no you know what? Uh -oh. I'm at five. I'm at five percent. I knew this was going to happen. Do this you have a plug in Oh, I can maybe run Central up to the Park? car and find a. Uh, get it. Uh, I, I have a, a 
a brick in my car I can get. But that'd be awesome. Man. I didn't down. want you to get away with not sharing more about some of these genetics, dude. Yeah. So Jesse will be right back. He's going to get an extended battery for his phone. What a treat it has been, guys. My goodness gracious, learning so much about the black dog. And we'll learn about some of that G-nut. I'm definitely interested. That G-mob for sure. Uh, I'm just really ecstatic uh, to be able to connect with Jesse. You know, uh, Some things take time. And he'll be back in just a second. It gives me a chance to drink some water, look at the time, and we'll go as much as we can, man. We'll try to go maybe another 45 minutes to an hour. We'll see what's up. I won't tell them how long we've been, you know. And it, time goes by fast, so the original plan was about a couple hours, but I think we'll get Jesse right back, you know. Getting that battery, going to get back to a sweet spot for his Wi-Fi uh, where he's at in Trinidad. And check that out, man. Trinidad out in Humboldt County. It is uh, right on the coast, and it's beautiful, dude. Check out Google Images. Uh, you ever out there? Uh, Moonstone Beach is beautiful. Highly recommend visiting uh, Trinidad if you're ever in uh, Northern Humboldt. Hey, it's Chris Callahan. I think I know. Uh, I think I know who you are, my bro. Shout out to everybody that's watching. Dalton, Pac Man, Sunshine. Growing Life Organic. Ow. Hell yeah, dude. Jesse should be back in just a second. Let me check my phone real quick. He'll be back soon. Okay. There he is. Oh, yeah. Back. All right. Woo. <clears throat> Not getting the audio. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh shit! No, 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 no. I'm not on mute. Yep, all good. If you're not getting the audio, you did something last time that worked, but I can hear you. Yeah, dude. The marijuana multiverse. What an amazing place to be, guys. We can hear Jesse, but he can't hear us. Hello. All right, all right. Mike's not working. Maybe. Okay. Uh, I can hear you. I can hear you. He'll be right back, guys. He'll be right back. Absolutely. It's just a few more days till Christmas. Uh, shit, man. Um, not carrying any BioVortex at the moment, but you can see what we got on the website at gwsb.tv. Uh, I still got to add Jackson's uh, gear, Freeborn Selections, to the website. Okay, here we go. And then I'm going to remove you. Cool. Look who's here. All right. Can you hear me now? Yep. Awesome, dude. So we were talking about the black dog, and you're about to share something before you realized it was low battery time. Oh, I think I was just saying, um, yeah, some really amazing artwork that Rat King uh, got put together for these silk um, scarves that will be um, getting done up. But if you look at Moon Maid Farms, you can see the image. That's right, Cherry that. Moon. Yeah, and it's got, yeah, it's got the Cherry Moon goddess and the, there's a really cool um, mythology, uh, the Chinese mythology story that's connected to that as well. And, um, also just connection with Tina from Moon Maid Farms. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful image. And it's, it's got the goddess on the moon with a whole bunch of uh, cherry moon plants. And um, anyway, really appreciate the way that artwork came out and excited to um, get them, get them uh, created and out there. Absolutely, man. Uh, what I want to say real quick is, uh, What's the Gina? You know, what are some of these other strains that you got that are cracking, man? Like G Mob, G Nut. What's going on, man? Yeah. Um, so hazelnut cream um is an amazing uh hash variety. Uh friend Julian with Dab Logic helped or he he hunted through um some of those and found just this amazing hash quality uh selection from it. 
And so Dab Logic, both in Colorado and California, had been working with that. Uh, the in Dab Logic in California, as soon as they came out here, they wanted to work with my um, uh, my genetics is to that were along those hash lines to work with. And, um, you know, a lot of the GMOB work and stuff came out of that, uh, as well as a lot of other um, varieties. Um, you know, Holy Nana Crack, a lot of the banana crosses. But the Gina is um, combining the that hazelnut um, clone selection with with the GMOB. Uh, and in working with the GMOB, it made selections of some of the highest uh, hash yielding varieties. So, um, you know, you'll see a lot of varieties. It's like you get almost no return. You know, some varieties might be one or two percent. Uh, once you get to three, then you're like, you know, you can actually it's it's worth doing and stuff. But um, you know, some of these varieties you're seeing seven, you know, six, seven, sometimes eight percent from. So, uh, and identifying those varieties that are going to wash twice as much as a, a good average yielder than um keeping those selections and then using utilizing them for breeding so uh, one of those was the 392 um so there's actually you know hundreds of plants and out of and each one got actually washed separately and stuff too and identified because of sam from dab logic making sure to do that work and us working intimately in that process and so we made uh four really nice standout clone selections that were all seven eight percent yielders and i utilize those in the next generations of um of gmob uh i also made the gmob bc1 so taking the gmob which is the banana og SFVOG black dog um and that mail from that almost made everything hashy that it went on um unless it had terpinaline or something or cbd but all of the you know hashy varieties just got hashier with it and even medium ones became hashy so it was a really identified that plant as like an amazing one to continue um to, to bring more hash qualities out of different varieties um so put that back onto gmo again uh made that back cross and then put that on to the 392 selection um which is a uh, you know one of the hash standouts that was so pretty from that gmob line and then put that on to that hazelnut cream selection to make the g-nut um, yeah, we released that in Alpine, sold out pretty quick, but I'm, I'm about to release the uh, BC1. So now it's uh, a, back on the hazelnut a second time. So I, I took the GMA, the GNUT, the hazelnut uh, GMOB, so the hazelnut GMOB 392 GMOB BC1, put that back onto that hazelnut again in one of my hash beds this year. And um, yeah, seeing the GNUT this year was so incredible. The Newcomb, Newcomb Family Farms in Willow Creek grew such beautiful varieties of that. And the hash came out so nice and brings in like kind of a cream and this full savory aspect to that like really funky banana thing that's coming from the GMOB too. Um, and they just, yeah, just worked great together. So just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous white giant heads on like these beautiful that you have the light purple and the kind of play between light and dark greens um you can see some of the images on on my instagram absolutely dude and so the gmob is like this banana funk is that pretty much what it's known for banana funk? yeah i mean certain ones uh you know might lean more on one side or the other but you get definitely it's they're all very savory and they're very complex and actually um out of uh, just so many hundreds of analytics of hash that we've gone through, um, it actually is the most terpene complex that we have seen, um, the the GMOBs that we've been working with. So um, the ones that Radical Herbs just grew last year and DabLogic washed, um, yeah, had the most uh, diverse and full terpene profile ever seen out of all of the years of washing hash. So that was pretty cool to see. Um, but definitely you have this like, it's like you have that savory aspect, like eating a really good meal, but then there's the little bit of that kind of like the dessert, there's gas and there's banana in there, but the funk is there, but a full complex kind of meal thing that's happening. And, um, and to have it grown by one of my favorite farms biodynamically in native soil, 
um, you know, with the copper. Right. They're they're one of the 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 farms from the film Tending the Garden, and uh, to have it, you know, uh, the communication between hash maker, breeder, and farm in collection and the work uh, is definitely an amazing trinity to to create some unique qualities. And um, I've had some of the, you know, some of the palettes that I respect the most have that be one of the standouts of the year in the last last couple of years um especially the the ones grown by radical herbs those those came out so so nice and they just did it again this year with the with new versions of it so very excited to see that um and then yeah the ones from the the newcomb family farms this year incredible and again just because i i'm uh wanting to keep up what daniel grew at radical herbs is gmob or gnut uh they they grew gmob uh the last two years um God. so they did um yeah gmob last year and then they did um yeah some selections out of that work that they continued uh growing this year so um yeah okay um yeah. so I, Will, I have a, uh, but newcomb yeah. family farms did the g nut and i like that so much that i put it on um pretty much all of my favorite hash varieties so i'm gonna oh, be they dropping the g nut you're saying no 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 no, no. i did yeah Oh, yeah, they yeah. grew it, yeah. But I, I used um, oh. male selections from <laughs> that same group that um, they grew out there uh, for my hash beds this last year. And so I put it onto so many of my favorite hash varieties. So I put it back onto Banana OG, which I'm going to be releasing today. Uh, put it back onto Hazelnut. Put it back onto the GMob 392, um, which did release and that sold out immediately. Um, put it onto Papaya Punch, Motor Breath, uh the mandarin which um you know is like this incredible it, it smells just like an orange peel i don't know if anyone if anyone's had the hash from simply adam that's that's the mandarin that i've been uh that i had yeah been working with for a while that um yeah and all all of that would came from um living soil native soil and um beds that made specifically for for that hash making process um and so, yeah, excited. I haven't got to see those ones yet, but wait, wait, wait. quick question. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. You said beds made specifically for the hash making process. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Oh, well, I mean, they grow flowers fine, but um, I guess that I want the hash to not to just be a true example of that hash. Like, I'm not really into. Uh, nutrients or anything that's going to affect flavor and never never spray never anything i just want the pure expression of the plant so oh. building beds with the intent to make hash with the hash maker so it was actually really cool like some of those beds um even had um simply adam the hash maker working with us it was like you know let's do this from the beginning so like come help build beds with us and then also think about dust and stuff and so like you know polyculture and plants are ever so there's very all around so there's very little dust but even where there's going to be tarps going down or us walking make sure to rock everything clean everything and so I, I really like that like concept of working with the hash maker from the beginning to have the cleanest possible trichomes for them to start with and so like you know thinking of that trichome farming like and like people will be like, oh my God, we got a bug and we spray it. And it's like, well, if you're planning on using it for hash, like even if it's some organic stuff, you just destroyed it. Like you don't want any other hash makers. They're working to make a pure product and remove all contaminants, right? So why are you contaminating your plant? Um, so really, by, I just mean kind of the do nothing approach, except for creating a very healthy environment in, in the soil and the surrounding area and no dust and no sprays um but and and utilizing um living soil so like those beds were made from the neighbors um cow manure mixed with uh mushroom block composting and you know doing um work around the area and polyculture and um cover cropping like that's the the soil building um so having it be a true expression of nature is is what i mean by a hash bed i guess no, I get it. I get it, dude. I now I understand. Now I understand, dude. Uh, okay, holy shit. So we got, we got the G mob. We got the G nut. And oh, also, also put the G nut on Athena. 
So, and Athena oh. grows some of the biggest, most amazing heads. And I remember when Adam first washed the Athena, the Athena Sour Kush number two selection, which I used the exact same one to to cross with it this year. Um, it, those were some of my, that's some of my favorite. That was like the moment when I realized how good hash could be. I mean, the banana showed me the, the qualities, but when he washed that, it was just like, it was unbelievable. And this was right at that moment before you saw all this amazing, good, full, fresh frozen, full melt ever. It was right at the beginning when there's only, you know, a couple people doing it, um, you know, village, Matt rise and, and like simply Adam, it was just at that, that point where this started and to see that the way the Athena melted and the, how clean it was. And there was no residue left behind. Like it didn't need to be rosin. It was that clean. And it was like, I remember doing a post. I was like, sorry, hydrocarbons, like <laughs> got no use for you anymore. Like it, it just changed from that moment on when I saw that first Athena sour kush like wash. And then like the way it just like the effects of it were just so strong. Um, you know, it was like a, what I think I described it as like a lemon flavored gold boot to the head or something like it was yeah. just. Yeah. <laughs> gold just, boot to the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious lemon, right, it, yeah it had the no. lemon butter pepper kind of qualities to it but the heads on it are huge too so like you know the 90 and the 120 and the 150 are just gorgeous gorgeous um and wow. almost nothing there's not really that much 70 you know it's like bigger heads um so i'm really really excited for to see how that does and um yeah i know i know people are gonna love it so excited to, to release that in the near future dude so freaking cool Real quick before we keep talking about the magic, uh, you know who Nick T is, Nick? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, I have some of the hash that he made here. Cool. He's been doing it for so long. You know, I went to some of his talks, uh, Emerald Cup and stuff like when all of this was pretty young too. Uh, I think he was the first person I saw kind of talking about res uh, rosin and and stainless oh, steel. Oh, cool. Sure. Yeah. Yes, it's kind of not in focus. Should I smoke? You want me to smoke some of this? Or I also have this Nasha. Nasha? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Nasha? But it's, uh, it says Papaya Bomb Onyx Pressed Live Hash. Cool. So or that's, yeah, pa Papaya with THC Bomb. Um, or I, should just do I both? think Purple Cities did that cross. You know, uh, <laughs> Nasha actually has a whole bunch of G-Mob, too. Um, they have it from Atoll Valley Farms. Uh, really? Nasha actually has been working with my stuff forever. Um, the Holy Nana Crack actually is what brought us together. I, Holy I did, Nana somebody, Crack? Did that out in Willow Creek, and it was the first time uh, Nasha ever did Fresh Frozen. <laughs> and he'd ne never seen yields like that before. It kind of changed his his world of what was possible in hash um and uh yeah it's been cool working with uh him and his his partner farmers and every year he's been good about uh, making sure the farms grow some of the genetics that's fucking sick is it the holy nana nick's work from green source gardens no i gave him the holy nana but that, that you, you're the holy nana i'm holy nana yeah but nick is now too <laughs> <laughs> we're all holy but yeah yeah he, i mean if you look i'm sure he he uh it's you know, I'm I'm credited on that on the site and stuff if you look, but oh, it's my ignorance, dude. You're the holy nana. That's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, and actually the Emerald Cup did it. I mean, uh, you know, Phoebe yeah. um uh, actually came up and got some for uh the Emerald Cup genetics years back, probably maybe that was 2017 that they washed it. It was 16, 17 time. Um, and you know, they grow they grew these like all the plants got so huge, they were like 10 pound plus, and they all yielded like six and up percent you know most of them were like seven percent and they did like holy nana crack like one number one two three like up to ten and i got to taste like a few of them and they were phenomenal people still talk about them too i, I just saw maya from um home edibles and like she was talking about that being one of her favorites that still stuck out too and that's so legend dude another palo uh, cool. bro you gotta let us know what the holy nana crack is dude what the heck that's well, an it, awesome it, name, by the way. Yeah, so that goes back to like the Santa Cruz roots because it's the Big Sur uh, holy weed uh, with with green crack, and so you know Michael Kaigu and you know um, Graham, uh, Mr. Bob Hemphill and Kaigu, uh, Bam to the coastal seeds back in the day. They did that cross uh, same banana OG that I actually used to this day. Actually went into some of the crosses they did, um, but the they had the holy nana from 
Kaigu, who's uh, um older gentleman who's been holding down uh, a lot of the old stuff and also does a lot of land race work, a lot of Burmese lately too. Um, he suffered from cancer and was actually growing a lot of different um, longer term flowers from different land race varieties from different parts in his greenhouses. And, and um, yeah, just amazing preservationist, and, you know, from both old Santa Cruz varieties, but also looking at the land race stuff. Um, oh, good question. Yeah. Um, are you telling us about the provenance or the background of the Big Sur at this point that you mentioned coastal seeds? That's where you yeah, get the yeah. Big Sur from? So the Big Sur Holyweed, yeah, they, they, you know, that had been around for quite some time. I think it's yeah. dates back to the late seventies or so. I heard um, about it. Yeah. And, um, so using that with the, uh, it, it was actually a cross with green crack, which makes it a little bit earlier and and those qualities were super nice it had very sandy uh quality i immediately recognized it as being really nice for hash so i i put it onto um the banana og and um that was the first year of the holy nana crack which i've worked quite a bit since too um and uh recently actually did a bunch this year where i did the sfd dog holy nana crack and that's where i found a lot of um uh some of the fully powdery mildew resistant varieties too like it can't get bud rot too that's a very like bud rot resistant variety too um same with the gmob too incredible against bud rot um especially the the varieties that are a little bit more segment so a lot of them are spears where the the flower itself is more separate so you do there's none of those big chunky colas that get mold it's also a later variety um which you know a lot of people want it to be earlier because they're concerned with mold but a lot of times earlier varieties too like that first rain comes and you got super chunky nugs that's that's where issues come in where like gmob is just setting up and it's impossible for it to rot like that and and then it impossible. just sail, sails in well like um and uh metol metol valley sun grown dylan yeah he grew the gmob last couple of years but um he'd sent me last year yeah uh on november 7th he was like just harvested the gmob november 7th and it had rained so much at that point too at like different times and like you know it's like a lot of people had a lot of issues but he's like zero powdery mildew zero mold on any of it it all looks gorgeous and just like hung it up and it made great hash so it was really cool to see might have made a little bit more hash without the rain but it it stood up to it no no problem okay so for the record it's not holy nana the real name is holy nana crack is that correct um, you know, like it depends. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was Holy Nana and it was, yeah. Holy Nana crack is, is the original name. Um, and it is green crack on the Big Sur Holy Weed. But if you want to just call it Holy Nana and leave the crack out, that's fine. I got no problem with that. Although I, I have to point out one of my favorite varieties, uh, when I was a kid, actually in high school, uh, it was, it was actually a variety called uh, crackhead that we used to get back in like uh i guess yeah 96 97 and um the effects of it were so strong and and euphoric and stuff and like uh we just super loved it so like that was like something immediately like sold out every time anyone smoked it like they're just like oh my god how do i get more and then it it left this amazing aroma in the air that i still think about today uh some kind of like uh tropical funk and like you know there is like mango and piss qualities i don't even know but it was um how to describe it now but one of those ones that stood out and i also think about uh you know arcada train rack back in the day first coming up too and like actually those effects were pretty pretty unique and cool and and a, and a really neat aroma i think it was 98 when i first um tried that one but now uh train wreck has terpinaline yeah it's, but it's not like uh too too crazy and pining and stuff but yeah the yeah but the holy nana absolutely does not and nothing that um uh that washes normally you know terpinaline is almost never there it has its Got cool it. effects it's not necessarily like my go-to thing i love everything but um but yeah i do i do like terpinaline in the right places at the right times and i like it with a lot of cbd varieties too like the sapphire sue i love the way actually terpinaline's blended in that it because there's this like thick cushy gassy base to it with that super kind of spike to it and it has a both 
it, it, it gives you that like, you know, oh, these are dank flowers, but it, like very medicinal quality to it. It was neat to see Leapley actually wrote up um, uh, the Sapphire Sioux grown by Moon Maid Farms too as one of the top uh, 12 varieties of the year. And it was the only one that was a CBD uh, terpenaline variety for sure. Only one with CBD in it. So I was neat to see. That's so wild, man. Yeah, my epiphany is that I thought Nick at Green Source was holy nana dog, but you're holy nana dog. Yeah. Well, the dog could clue you in. <laughs> black, yeah, black dog for sure. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and um, yeah, he's uh, they've done such great work with it. Um, uh, bring the banana dog with the, the holy nana and, and uh, a lot of other varieties too. Um, and there's a lot of my stuff that's like mixed into the... Um, there's the red lion, which is the, um, you know, has my Voltron in it. Um, what the hell? That's what I'm saying. What, what's yeah. Voltron and red lion? Voltron was actually Athena Sourquish with Sapphire Scout. Holy crack. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, put the Holy Nana crack onto Sapphire Scout and then put that onto um, the Athena Kush and, oh, and Black Dog. So, yeah, it was Black Dog, Sapphire Scout, Holy Nana, and Athena. So it was kind of like, it was a for, form Voltron. Athena's the mm -hmm. head, you know, and like Black Dog. <laughs> they got the like, got the arms, Sapphire Scout arms, and like, yeah. But so, because one of the arms is, um, you know, they're all lions. So they called, uh, they also got the, um, although it was bred by Keith Sweat originally, the um, glazed cherries from me. And so that went in to make the red lion, was the glazed cherries in that Voltron. And then they bred that with Bodhi's. Um, Maybe Stayfly was involved in that one too, but the White Lotus, and so they had the um, yeah the Red Lotus that they have out now too. But it's cool. I love like seeing like yeah some Stayfly, some Bodhi, some me, some Jack, you know, a Green Source work all mixed in and some of these varieties. And um, yeah, it's just that community work towards breeding, and and they're truly breeding at that in a place, you know, and um, and doing natural cycles, and it's a hundred percent seeds. They they don't use clones. Um, and I, I feel like I get to aid in that a little bit too. I'll make selections and do that kind of work and get them more seeds too. And, um, but the way they do the very natural breeding and, and to do it year after year and pay attention and the label and put the seeds away thoughtfully, uh, and to truly do line bred projects before doing their F1 hybrids, which is what an actual F1 hybrid is is two lion bread varieties put together um so like it yeah just really a lot of respect for the work that um nick and liz do because to take something to eight nine generations before putting them together to make f1s is is um it's it's a it's quite an amazing task of love and and intention and what happens from that is tr is is very vigorous uniform plants and that's what's done in most traditional uh, seed breeding as far as like varieties of flowers and food. Um, most of what's grown are F1 hybrids because there's more vigor. But if you've done it with fully lint line bread or in inbred lines, then you actually make a uh, consistent, vigorous uh, next generation or first generation, F1 generation. <laughs> that's so wild, man. That's so wild. Um... Uh, so uh, is there anything else currently like that sold out? That's not G mob G not related. Um, like releases. Yeah. Well, I've been doing a lot of, the, I, I've been releasing some of the, um, the double OGZ dog, uh, crosses. So, um, and I really like actually the way that worked with the black dog and a lot of other things. Um, but it already has black dog in it a lot because it's, it's actually, um, it's a JS OG, my buddy, Josh, who like saved this really nice OG from way back when classic SFV OG, um, with the black dog BC four. And, um, it was an F two from that, that I crossed with the Z dog, which is taking the black dog BC five F two, putting that onto Skittles and then putting it onto Skittles again. Cause I really like the profile of Skittles, but it's a, nobody likes growing the plant. It's a, relatively weak and sus susceptible and not the prettiest or strongest variety out there to grow um but grabbing that flavor profile so 
using that black dog to create a strong, healthy plant with strong branches, good balance, easy to grow, resistant, um, and carrying over some of those flavors and blending them a bit and making the, the back cross so the double onto Skittles twice to really get that flavor. Um, then putting that onto the the gas from the double OG uh, dog. And um, then I put that onto a bunch of different things. So I put that onto, and it was calling them like black dogs, just putting a Z at the end and cherry lime dogs. And, um, but yeah, crossed through a lot of things this year too. Um, Mandarin cherry lime dog put back onto uh, G mob, the 392 um, hazelnut. You know what I thought of right now? The Kemi no, Jones. Oh, I was yeah, thinking of the reservoir the, dogs with Z's instead of yeah, S's. Yeah, reservoir yeah, yeah, dogs yeah, yeah. the dogs, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Reservoir dogs, I like it. Um, yeah, I can name them all different colors too, right? <laughs> Mr. Purple, Mr. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Something just completely filled with trichomes, Mr. White, you know. <laughs> you got pink Mr. pistols, Mr. Pink. You're not Mr. Yeah. Yellow or there's another guy in the job name, Mr. Yellow. You're Mr. Pink. <laughs> I can't be something cool uh, with Mr. Black. Um, yeah dude uh man so like uh what how so how did that how, how is that how is the the skittles cross oh it, so yummy actually skittles? those are and the newcombs grew some of that this year too newcomb family farm um it's like the gas and candy is fully there a little subtle at first but once it cures it was just like oh my god this is exactly what i like so it's been kind of my go-to jar lately uh is and they're almost gone i have like just little bits of saving i need to try to try to get a little bit more from that particular batch um but i i love that that flavor profile because it's 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 candy gas all round together with the black dog in the right way um chunky flowers gorgeous but like once it's cured up then it's it's that thing you know some flowers might be oh my god it's so over the top turpy um this isn't one of them but once it's in the jar and and it's the right dry then it takes on that addictive flavor you know that thing that i've never got bored of um so yeah i like i like i love the candy gas that's so dope i'm taking hash bong hits right now trying to keep up (laughs) (laughs) so dude Uh, <laughs> what do you got for going uh what do you got going on next, <laughs> excuse me next year <laughs> any new directions new new like strains in the mail <laughs> excuse me um absolutely <laughs> i mean i'm always going to keep working down the, the hash lines i really like doing hash because um dabbing's my my favorite w- way to enjoy cannabis just a nice courts i like i like uh low temp cold start dabs on a thick quartz base um small dab rig and um that's just like my go-to to enjoy because and i like that control of 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 terpene release because i can choose the temperature i can go low temp release um the mono terpenes and kind of explore each different boiling point a little bit and what gets released. And so that's the way I like to really appreciate flowers. And it's so easy on you, you know, there's no contaminants and there's, you're not burning carbon. You're, you're, um, using your, um, you know, it's, it's the vapor of, of that resin. Um, and so, uh, I hate vape pens and all of that, but I love perfect, you know, just that, that light, Low temp where you can fully taste all the flavors come out and then add a little bit more and that releases more cannabinoids when you get a little bit more of those hot temps. But I like that choose your own adventure of where you want to be. And I can I can get all that flavor without getting too high potentially, but then I can just hit a little bit more and and and, and get right to where I want to be. And I really like that actually too for sharing cannabis um, with family members and with older folks and, you know, because I can um give them something that like i I can kind of control how how strong it will be um and also like how light it will be on their lungs and on the effects and um a lot of people like are scared of dabs or something like oh it's gonna mess and then realize that like oh wow that's a really light uplifting effect when um if you're releasing 
more terpenes than cannabinoids then um then they're just like like what what what's happening all these flavors are dancing on my tongue and i feel like a little light and euphoric and not like that anxiety hard high um so yeah i'm going to continue i love looking at trichomes seeing that sandy quality like uh or tacky you know if something just greases out it's probably not going to work but it might be really nice for other things because it's definitely full of um some nice terpenes a lot of times it'll be like a lot of myrcene or something like that in those varieties but um understanding kind of the the morphology of trichomes that work for for washing and also the chemical makeup that that goes with that so and i see specific things uh kind of fall in line with hash yielders and it's almost always very high thc high beta carphylene high limonene and um you know myrcene is normally in there just because it's so prevalent but it doesn't necessarily like lend to being washers and if mercy gets too high then it takes a little bit away from that but you almost always see high limonene beta carophylline and um and thc in in washers and they're and have in having that kind of sandy or tacky quality and large head size um and not not just necks and not little head like but bulbous nice um cannabinoid and terpene filled heads that have some mentality or have some uh strength to their structure although then also you get to the point of how much cuticle is there you know um because what's keeping them sandy or strong is a cuticle which um if you make the rosin that's going to be separated when the oil comes out is it cuticle, like excuse like me. Oil. yeah is the cuticle that external layer like the, the external R layer yeah that's what's holding in that those those cannabinoids and oils and 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 terpenes um and some have very light ones and they burst really easy um some of them burst really easy because of the um terpenes and and chemicals that might be inside um others uh, might have the ones that are more stable of what's inside too uh, banana og very sandy very easy to separate and wash uh, the holy nana absolutely the case g mob um is like that and so finding that play of like something being stable and sandy and potentially kind of tacky and having um those effects and, and aromas that you want to um but yes. yeah i'm going to continue yeah. down the hash i love working with hash makers uh one of my favorite things though is is working with all of the the farms and other breeders and going to all the farms that grow the seeds and seeing them grow in different environments and being grown with love by all these awesome people um that i'm very blessed to have some of the best you know farms you could imagine growing uh the plants so well in such beautiful places with beautiful soil and polyculture and and um yeah nature and food and family that's so cool dude um <clears throat> when we think about the globalization of this industry of the plant um uh, it seems like even though hash is like a, a resurging trend here in America, you know, European markets, they've been into hash. You know, a lot of people don't even smoke flowers uh, in, in those markets. Um, do you have any predictions for next year? Any, any, any way you feel about it? What may happen? Well, I think a lot of what is happening is will continue. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these big bastards will continue to, um, spend and lose a bunch of money and go down and the people who actually just love and care for it will continue on because that's what they do uh the people that are just in it for lesser reasons i don't see lasting because it's a difficult space to compete in. you have to actually completely love it and be committed to make it through this part and we've seen that we've seen people just completely blow uh you know these kind of bullshit companies just blow ridiculous amounts of millions um you know they had every advantage to to do something but it's a broken uh system you know nothing's ever been regulated and taxed the way cannabis is and um the uh all of the obstacles to operate a business as far as you know write-offs of, of uh payments of you know getting taxed in so many different ways even before you make a product you know the cultivation taxes on farmers before you even grow anything there's not never been anything like that um so uh i i see the kinks continuing to get worked out and i see um the people who love it being 
the the survivors although it's going to continue to be difficult um and uh, there's always going to be leeches siphoning away the money and taking advantage of things but um you know those kinds of parasites have uh if they're not good to their host they uh they don't last long right um it's the mutualistic organisms that um survive and thrive and that's how forest systems come to be in the balance that they are is through mutualism you know the redwoods out here um their relationship with salmon the salmon going out to the ocean bringing nutrients back up you know all of the life that grows with them the fungi the 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 hemlocks that grow and then get eaten by um mushrooms and return the the clovers the uh i'm sorry the sorrels and ferns like all of these things have developed mutualistic relationships with those giant old entities and so by observing like ancient forest systems i think we see how what lasts and it's it's mutualistic organisms um you know the parasite parasitic kind of um way of doing things is short-lived um you know there might be an opportunity then you use something up and then you kind of perish and things find a balance so i think we'll continue towards a mutualistic balance that mimics forestry systems um unless we you know kill everything which is a likely path too but um <laughs> but if if things do survive it's going to be through mutualism and through through mutualistic evolution with each other um and i think cannabis is a great teacher of that because that's uh a plant that has been in a mutualistic evolution with humans i think that's actually kind of the difference between cannabis and hemp in a way uh is is this relationship with humans and and it's been one that we can observe cannabis immediately gives um what we are looking for right like and and it's been happening for thousands of years and hash has been one of the big ways uh one of one of the gifts that cannabis has given and has had a, a deep relationship with humans in that and so people have chosen plants that produce good hash and have domesticated them and if you're choosing from a flower that you really like and keeping those seeds that changes the evolution of that plant almost immediately uh, you look at these low lab varieties the the true um primordial varieties that like erasin has, has shared with me their seeds are very small and they like disperse easy and they're kind of very much um uh set to survive on their own they're like wolves and you know and cannabis for me is kind of like dogs and what's the difference between a dog and and a wolf and that's an evolutionary mutualistic relationship that was entered into with humans it's when we started working together dogs hunting with us you know like we had we have the saluki from thousands of years ago in egypt hunting rabbits and bringing them back to people and running at like over 40 miles an hour um that was highly selected and bred for but through a mutualistic relationship with with um those animals and um dogs have become one of the most successful uh, organisms on the planet as far as far as the fact that they are everywhere and they are you know in many places taken care of, you know they eat they they breed they 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 they're in every part of the planet even even um antarctica right like there's no place that doesn't have dogs and that's because of the mutualistic relationship entered in with humans you could say the same with cannabis and i bet somebody some some uh science climate change researcher probably has like a few plants growing in some science station in antarctica even you know like cannabis is everywhere because of that mutualistic relationship so i think the more we study from that lesson uh that cannabis gives us uh the, the better our hope for survival will be well what does it mean to you man to have uh we have an endocannabinoid system as does every mammal on the planet so that's more, more evidence of this mutualistic relationship that we've been in for a very long time yeah, and dude. cannabis giving being a giving plant um you know and a healing plant um of course these giving and healing plants have been uh used in unbalanced ways and for selfish ways and um you know tobacco is a sacred plant and has been used in sacred ways for quite some time uh and you know the native american traditions with it are um very uh positive and profound right and but there is no 
abuse of that plant and you know with colonialization like hey oh there's this we can we can uh exploit the addictive natures of this giving plant and we can grow it using slave labor and we can grow tobacco using pesticides and we can ship it with the intent to get people addicted knowing that there is harm once you enter into that kind of relationship the harm that comes from these sacred plants like you know they want to be treated with respect they are living entities they are spiritual beings and for some reason we are lost to that and it's and it's um through the miseducation of colonialism <clears throat> this has happened um but we need to remember that these are living sacred beings with spirits that deserve our love and respect and by doing that you are loving and respecting yourself wow dude this is so profound so profound so cool dude uh can't where can we watch tending the garden oh it's on the website tending the garden film.com anyone can go there uh also if you're following my instagram a link in my bio just click right on it uh you can rent it for five dollars right now and um yeah watch it anywhere in the world and that's, three that's the most amazing farms um yeah you get to see a, a year in the life of uh some of the the best farmers and cannabis growing um food growing cannabis raising families and and connecting with community and earth in a, a positive way just like murder mountain right <laughs> oh yeah but the antithesis dude it, it's the solution <laughs> man the way of showing our community in a, in a in a better light yeah to say the least uh we have a quick question i'd, I'd like to answer for dalton benjamin davis here uh the question is does jesse have an early finishing hash variety that he recommends well um yeah so i did um i do have a few but I, i'm excited actually about the black dog gmob uh work in the last two years um putting gmob back on to the original 2012 black dog and um and then making uh selections from there uh i picked out some very resistant very hashy varieties last year um, i'm about to get into separating some of those seeds but it's gonna cut off that flowering time but i still selected for those those hash purposes um yeah a lot of the hash varieties are longer term in general you know like the holy nana and bananas and gmos and gma and like um but hazelnut's not particularly long too so the g nut's not terrible but it's you know it's still not like a short term but uh yeah by going back into the black dog um and that's a variety that's short that still lends to the hash qualities a lot of other shorter varieties might not um, I also, the papaya punch, um, gets really chunky, grows a bit faster. And I put the G nut on that. So, um, I was very impressed actually with how well papaya punch develops, uh, on the coast, as far as having some chunky nugs in the fog, um, without, you know, the sun that normally you'd need to get that kind of chunk. So, um, yeah, I'd recommend, which, yeah, I'll try to drop that very soon to papaya punch G nut and the the um black dog gmail back crosses so dope man so dope <clears throat> let's see i i've i've really enjoyed this conversation like you wouldn't believe dude um what what i'm saying is uh you know we started off this conversation acknowledging that the world is um you know uh can, it, it, there's a lot of negativity a lot of violence a lot of there's genocide happening right now there's deforestation and so forth um you know in many ways even though i've heard of these concepts before it's different when you feel like you're taking it personal and you're part of a community that is pro taking action you know and and so for those of us that are watching this and that will watch this um and and want to take a step towards environmentalism you know what do you recommend man yeah um there's a quote from the book um braiding sweetgrass from that was written by robin walkamir um a native woman who's a poet and a botanist uh very brilliant book recommend it for everyone um <clears throat> but the quote was uh sustain the ones that sustain you and the earth will last forever 
So being mindful of what you support and who you support and how being mindful of just the way you spend money, like, you know, go to farmers markets, get the food that's more nutritious for you and support your local community. Uh, when that money goes uh, to corporations, um, it might be funding war. It might be funding genocide. It might be funding um, environmental rape. It might be funding, um, you know, um, slavery, uh, human rights violations. Um, it, so being mindful of where your money, like you put your life into making that money, right? Your, your time, your lifeblood, your energy. So put it back to the people that, you know, should be supported. So support your local farmers, support your environmental movements, support the people that are helping to provide water and resources and, um, and, um, you know, peace. <laughs> don't, don't let that money go to the wrong places. Um, you know, and, and that's a difficult thing. We have to fill our gas tank to get places. Um, but being mindful while you, you do it, you know, like, don't forget, don't be mindless, you know, know the impact when you fill the tank that, you know, maybe you have to do it and you don't have to take on that guilt, but, um, being thoughtful in, in supporting people that you support. And, um, that's how we do it. You support community and you support the things that matter and you do things with love. Yeah. There's that word again, man. <clears throat> so, so cool, Jesse, besides tending the garden and right now we can find your seeds at Alpine seed group.com, even though they're sold out at the moment. Um, oh, anything oh, else you want to share with going to do a solstice release? Uh, I'm going to re-release oh, some yeah. of the things today. We're going to drop, uh, you know, I right. felt bad. A lot of things ran out. So I'm going to dip into my, uh, my breeder stock and re-release some of the things. So keep your eyes peeled and drop a few new things today. I'm going to be dropped in the banana G nut going to drop. Um, oh, actually the, uh, the G nut hazelnut back cross, um, also radio flyer, which was like grown by, um, Bryson forest farms, one of the film farms in the film, uh, to perfection this year. Really pretty, pretty variety. Today's solstice, right? Today's solstice at, at 7.27 p.m. Today is the uh, the the mark. You know what's funny, dude? That's so cool. I'm going to remember that as best as I can. Is I remember in the conversation we had yesterday, maybe I misunderstood it, but you mentioned like you're going to go to a solstice party is what I remember. And so when I had called you earlier before the show trying to connect with you, I was like, oh, man, I bet you this guy was out like, you know, having a good time last night, solstice party. I was envisioning like, checking out the moon being out all night for some reason even though it's a solstice party and uh here we are and it's today i thought i thought it was yesterday or yeah i'm all i'm here in the city bro i'm, I'm trying to plug in better and better you know but yeah my wild night was uh we, we went to the beach watched the sunset then uh came home made some dank food and uh watched uh actually the blue eye samurai uh we were talking about animations earlier recommend that so it's like one of the best things i'd watched in a while amazing it's just so well animated, the storytelling, it's layered. It's, uh, yeah, I haven't very, very impressed. I didn't realize how impressed I'd be. And I just crushed through the whole thing, but we did. Yeah. It was, um, anyway, <laughs> good recommendation. Dope, man. Dope. And, uh, shit, man. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything at all? Like anything we may have missed anything well, like, uh, you want to promote about today's release? Um, yeah, I mean, I just go to Alpine, check out the things. I think I mentioned most of the ones that are getting released. Um, also, there will be some new Black Dog drops, too. Um, I did some Black Dog's Gift, too, which is like a um, and the Cherry Lime Dog gift as well, and G-Mob's gift uh, that I'm excited to drop. And it's it's Bubba's Gift, Black, it's Black Dog and Bubba's Gift. Um, that I did a back cross with that I really loved that I put with the cherry Valley dog, which is a, um, cherry lime dog, um, SFVOG black dog. And then that put back onto those originals. So, um, excited to, to get those available very soon too. Um, but yeah, today, you know, marks that, that moment of the, 
the darkest day of the year and they they truly are in world events right now so um yeah i just want to offer a, a prayer to the uh, returning of the light thank you jesse thank you so much <clears throat> it's been such a beautiful conversation dude i can't thank you enough and i didn't want to tell you the time you know we're nearing three hours which i think is is so <laughs> yeah. cool time for me to 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 go eat some food and get yeah, ready me for too. the rest of the yeah, day 100%. thank you man thank you for your time dude Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for, for sharing uh, a bit about your journey and um, your, your travels and yourself. And uh, I commend your uh, journey towards um, vulnerability and fearlessness and, and love. Um, I see it. I see you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. Um, wouldn't happen without the beautiful people in our community. And I uh, definitely look forward to, you know, connecting with you down the road. And we talked about some things, but yeah, man, this has been uh, Jesse BioVortex, you guys. What a pleasure, man. Um, uh, you guys can tune in next week for another live. And just want to thank you guys for watching. Peace. Thank you.